I'm Andrew Medford. I'm the editor of uh, Growing for Market magazine and also have a farm up in Maine. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about me during the presentation, but um, I figured I want to just hand some of these out. Uh, so it's Growing for Market magazine. It's been uh, it's in uh, the 20, our 29th year. Uh, obviously, I did not start the publication. Um, <coughs> so, um, in fact, it was started by a woman you may know. Her name is Lynn Bazinski. She is the um, she wrote the book The Flower Farmer, which a lot of people still use. It's a really good resource for um, for uh, for growing flowers. And I took it over from her um, and moved the whole business to my farm up in Maine uh, in 2016. So. Um, in fact, those are two of my hoop houses right there. Do I have a, oh yeah, there's a dot. Okay, so yeah, those are two of my hoop houses up on my farm in Maine. They look very much like that right now. Uh, and so, <laughs> um, so this, I, I set this presentation up to go for about two hours because we have, we have two and a half hours, right? So, okay, so my idea was that if I make it two hours long, uh, then there's a chance I might not talk through the whole thing and there'd be time for questions. So, um, it, you know, there is time built in for questions here. Uh, there are more magazines on that on that back table. Um, you, you know, if, if you have a friend who's interested, please, please take one. Take as many as you as you want or you can give away. Uh, that's what they're there for. Um, so, um, uh, there is time built into this presentation for questions, right? Because I think there's there's a certain thing that I can bring here, but then, I, you know, you may you may have some other burning question, or I may have I may have gone right past what you really wanted to talk about. So, you know, feel free if you got a burning question, feel free to just raise your hand and we can address it um, during the course of the presentation. Um, on the other hand, hopefully there will be some time at the end that we can we can take questions too. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, growing for market for uh, has been around for 29 years now, and it's it's a really good resource for for uh, for growers. We try to keep it very practical, um, and m m most, if not all, the articles are, are by farmers, um, and getting their their hands dirty. And in most cases, they're telling you about uh, their operation. Um, so, um, oh, I, um, so on the in the the car ride down yesterday, I was thinking. Because I always think about, is there any way to sort of distill, you know, what we're trying to say down into a, its simplest form? Just because, yeah, you know, we're about to talk for two plus hours about greenhouse growing, as you saw from Steve's presentation. Um, there are a lot of details, right? And I'm really grateful that for Steve's presentation because I think he hit on a lot of the nitty gritty and some really good good advice for your your region right here. Um, and I don't think there's too much overlap um, between our presentations, but I was coming in the car down here and I thought, what, what is the simplest thing that I could distill this presentation down to? And, um, and so I thought, you know, what, what I'm really trying to say is that, that greenhouse growing is about trying to cram as many plants as you possibly can into the most precious real estate on your farm. And so, you know, you might say, well, how many plants is that? And we're going to talk about spacing and stuff like that in a little while. But um, so that's a good question. How many plants can you possibly cram into to, to a space? Because if you think about it, your hoop house or greenhouse, you've spent some money on the structure itself. You've probably put some money or your own sweat equity into building the thing. So it's, it's, the, most, um, it's the most expensive real estate on your farm. And it should also return the most um, of any of any space on your farm. So I'd say um, the idea behind greenhouses growing is to cram as many plants as you can keep healthy into any any given space. And so um, so that's that's what we're about. So we can talk about those details. But if if you leave nothing else today, you know I'd like you to leave with that mindset of thinking, you know, I need to get as many plants as possible into this space because it's it's limited, you know. It's not like uh, it's a little bit easier to, to go out and plow a field up or make new field space than it is to build a greenhouse and get it all prepped. You know, you've heard a lot about all the details of, of getting a greenhouse actually ready to grow today. So, so uh, you really need to make the most um, out of that out of that space. So, um, 
I did not grow up on a farm. Uh, I grew up in, in, in Virginia, actually, in the Mid-Atlantic, um, with a farm one generation back in my family. Uh, my grandparents had, still had a farm in Pennsylvania when, um, when, when I was growing up. And um, in fact, that's where we, we started our farm originally in Pennsylvania. That land got sold. We had to move on. That's why we're up in Maine now. But um, uh, the way that I learned to farm, uh, in fact, I, I met my wife working on a, a farm there in Pennsylvania. And we, we took off on what she calls the apprentice circuit. So we, we worked on six farms all around the country. Uh, part, of, part of the reason that we worked on so many is because after our first farm didn't work out, we went back to apprenticing again. So we did a little more apprenticing than we thought um, that we would initially do. Um, so I, I, learned, I learned about farming from working for other people. And so um, what I noticed after working on a bunch of farms is that most, most of the farmers that I was working for they were growing more or less the same way that they grew out in the field in, in a greenhouse, as far as same varieties, same choice of crops, same spacing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They basically just took their field plan and brought it indoors. And um, so uh, it, it wasn't until later uh, when I started working for Johnny Seeds that I was exposed to much bigger, much uh, uh, bigger greenhouse operations, and I realized there's a whole nother way to grow. There's a whole dedicated um, way of growing in, in greenhouses. Um, but it wasn't until I saw the alternative that I realized that, um, that there was an alternative. And um, so when I, was working on, when, when I was working at Johnny's, um, I, I was exposed to these, these larger, more commercial type greenhouses, and I thought, I wonder how much of that I can duplicate on my own farm. So back up a little bit, we started, uh, one, uh, my farm is called One Drop Farm. We'd started in Pennsylvania, kept the same name, just moved it up to Maine. Um, it was serendipitous moving to Maine in, in a certain way because um, we just happened to relocate about half an hour away from the Johnny's Research Farm there in Maine. And so uh, that actually that first winter, my wife and I, we both started working for Johnny's. We, we, you know, we are in the call center. We are the people. If you called up to to make a commercial seed order, we'd say, "Hi, thanks for calling Johnny's." Um, and a lot of farmers in the area do that, right? They they will go work for Johnny's as a winter winter work, and then get back to the farming in, in during the season. Uh, so, at the at the uh, at the end, uh, by the time spring was rolling around, uh, the, when I was there working at Johnny's, uh, Johnny's had just fired their tomato researcher, and I have a tomato obsession, and I thought. Well, that sounds interesting. So I, I applied, got the job, and I ended up working in the research department at Johnny's for the next seven years. So I was, what I was doing is I was running trials on. So if you look in the seed catalog and wonder, well, I, where did all these varieties come from? Well, of course somebody bred them, but then um, we, Johnny's and a lot of other seed companies you know, do trials, right? Because everything looks great in the seed catalog. Probably had this experience. Kind of got to grow it on your farm to see how it really stacks up to the other varieties. So what I, it was my job to um, keep on top of all the new tomato varieties. And um, over the course of time that I was working at Johnny's, we are seeing a huge growth of interest in, um, in greenhouse growing. And so, in fact, while I was there, they kind of carved out a position that I ended up taking, which was a greenhouse specialist. So part of that is because tomatoes are so important for greenhouse. I was already doing tomatoes. Um, so. Um, and I, at the same time, I was getting really into um, greenhouse growing because when we started our farm in Pennsylvania, it's a considerably warmer climate than here in, in New England. I think you're already, you're already a little bit warmer here in Connecticut than I am up in Maine and, you know, a, another degree of that down in Pennsylvania. So when we were in Pennsylvania, we were really not focused on greenhouse growing. We were just growing beautiful crops out in the field because there's a nice climate down there in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so. To move our farm from Pennsylvania to Maine when you're, you're really into tomatoes is kind of a rude awakening. And so just at the same time that Johnny's was getting a lot more um, interest in, in uh, greenhouse growing, I was getting more interested in greenhouse growing too. Because um, let's see, our first, our first full growing season there in Maine was 2009. I don't know if you guys got the late light here, but not only did, um, you know, was it hard for us to, to ripen large fruited tomatoes out in the field, we also got wiped out by late blight that year, and so I realized if we're gonna we're gonna be doing the um, the large fruited the tomatoes and things like that, we really need to get some some season extension here. Um, so 
I was getting really into greenhouse growing right at the same time that Johnny's was getting a lot more interested in greenhouse growing. And so I ended up uh, do, doing that, um, taking over the, green, you know, essentially being their greenhouse specialist, uh, which was awesome. It get, I got access to all kinds of just big commercial growers, um, university researchers and people like that, that otherwise don't, would not have had access to. And so um, I immediately started picking their brains and asking them all the questions that I, I possibly could. Um, so the, the upshot of all that is that I wrote this book called The Greenhouse and Hoop House Growers Handbook. And um, I would say that basically what this book is, is um, it's, it's all the stuff that I learned from the big commercial growers, try it out on my own farm and what worked of it. And most of it, most of it had some kind of uh, an application. Cause I'm going to show you some pictures in just a second of the kind of operations that I got to go visit. But they're really different from uh, from all the farms that I had ever worked on. Certainly, you know, um, over the course of time, I, I worked on farms in Pennsylvania and California, uh, Washington State, Virginia, um, upstate New York, and, and Maine. I had worked on farms all those states before um, before establishing our farm there, where it is in Maine, and I had worked in greenhouses. But but you know, no, no nobody who was really a dedicated um, greenhouse grower. So this came out. This came out uh, two years ago. This came out in February, or three years ago now, uh, February of 20, 2017. And actually, and I just wrote this book, or this this book just turned one year old. This came out in February of uh, 2019. Um, kind of a different subject. It's called the organic no-till farming revolution. But there are a lot of applications. Um, no-till works very well in greenhouses, uh, just because it's a it's a confined space. It's not really nice to run uh, rototiller and smell all the fumes in there and stuff like that. So kind of another topic. But most of the most of the material that I'm pre presenting on here today is from my book, The Greenhouse and Hoop House Growers Handbook. So um, let me just show you a few pictures of the kind of places that I got into that I I just I I, I knew existed but had never seen before. So for example, this is a this is a dedicated bell pepper greenhouse up in Canada. I, if I remember correctly, this was uh, 12 or 16 acres, just bell peppers. Uh, very high tech greenhouse. It's uh, all glass. Yeah, it's all glass. Um, they have, uh, you know, grow plants 16 or 20 feet tall. Um, okay, so I want to draw your attention. There's, there's this little four-way mirror up here because it's such, it's such a big place. Uh, people who are they drive around little golf carts and stuff like this in this greenhouse a lot and so so this little mirror somebody can watch and see if somebody's coming from the other direction so they don't have golf cart accidents in their um, their greenhouse but these are you know I've never been in a place like this uh, they they work on the plants and harvest them from these scissor lifts these white things over here are a little pepper uh, pepper slides because of course you know peppers are kind of brittle if you drop them into, into a harvest bucket from the height uh, at which they harvest them, they would they would likely bruise. And so what they do is, when they're harvesting, they they clip one of these little white things onto this this trolley here, and they just let them roll down into the basket. So uh, this kind of place, you know, I'm thinking these are the kind of places where if you go into a grocery store and see all the nice fresh produce on the shelves, these are the kind of places that are, are providing it. Um, this is a greenhouse out in California. At the time, it was the largest aquaponic operation in the country. I forget how many acres they had there. They're out of production now, but um, this is an interesting thing because they had all these tomatoes grown in um, growing in cocoa coir, but it was basically fed by fish poop. You know, if you if you're familiar with aquaponics, that's basically what they do. You know, they have have a big fish tank, and they basically recirculate and condition the fish fish waste uh, to go and become uh, fertilizer for the plants. So um, this is yet another. So this is a cluster tomato greenhouse up in Canada. A lot of my pictures are from Canada. Actually, the Canadian, I would say the Canadian greenhouse industry is more mature um, than the, the, the uh, USA um, greenhouse industry. And um, if, if anything, we're, we're catching up. They have this one particular area there in uh, Leamington, the K Leamington Kingsville area of Ontario. I, I think of it as South Detroit because what you do is you, you fly into Detroit and then you cross, you cross the border and actually go south a little bit. The reason that that a, a, a huge part of their greenhouse industry is, is, is uh, located right there is because it's right on the shores of one of the Great Lakes. I forget which lake it is, but they have a nice lake. The lake moderates the climate. Also, it's, it's the point, it's the very farthest southern point in Canada. So they're taking 
advantage of both their location and uh, the moderating of the weather by the by the lake. So they have huge they have a huge greenhouse industry um, there. And then then places like this. This is also in Canada. Um, so this is an interesting thing. Um, this so this these uh, so all this lettuce. See how there are no there are no pathways. So these, this lettuce is grown on, tra on troughs that are going across, across the screen here. And so, um, so it is, um, what happens is they have, they have nutrient solution that drips into the troughs on this side of the, of the greenhouse. And the, the solution flows, because the, the troughs are on a little incline, flows over to this side. And so these trays actually move automatically. What they do is they put, tr they put trays in the back there and then um, in the, the lettuce is all harvested from this side. And so they'll harvest out a, a trough of lettuce, move the trough, push a little button. All these troughs shift, and, um, and then they, they just harvest the next one. And the other thing is that where the lettuce comes on to this system over at the other side, it's much more closer together, right? Because if you think about it, you can, um, the, seed, the, the tiny plants can be a lot closer together than these plants out here. And at some point in the system, they, they actually, um, they actually make make them farther uh, the trays farther apart for the full size lettuces. So um, you know, I, I started going to all these places. It was really nerding out. I was re really loved the way that the, a lot of the growers, you know, the growers were really into this stuff too. So when I'd show up and start asking them a lot of questions, most of the growers that I talked to were very forthcoming. There, you know, there weren't a lot of secrets. In fact, most of them, if I asked them about what they were doing, they're like, all right. I don't know. We're doing it the way everybody else does because there really is this community of, of growers. In fact, a, a lot of them have a, are of Dutch background. In fact, yeah, um, uh, because Holland has such a big greenhouse tradition, you may you may hear me uh, make references during this presentation to the Dutch Dutch greenhouse growing methods because they 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 I feel like they really kind of innovated this technology. A lot of the the techniques that we now think of as pretty standard in greenhouse growing were originally by Dutch growers. To the point where I would go into some greenhouses and, and uh, the green the, the green the growers may be Dutch have you know public greenhouse publications in in Dutch lying around on their um, on their desks. So um, I I wanted to ask them all these questions about what they were doing, not because I wanted to do exactly what they were doing. You know my my farm was certified organic. We grow on soil. Um, at the time, most of our our greenhouses were unheated, right? So you you know if if you have a high tunnel, you may be saying, what does what does all this have to do with my high tunnel, my unheated soil grown high tunnel? Well, everything, because the principles of greenhouse growing and plant growth apply whether whether you've got a little tiny hoop house growing in soil or a gigantic greenhouse growing hydroponically. Um, and the question that I wanted to know was how many of these techniques would apply to my lower tech soil grown um, kind of planting. And it, you know, when, when I first saw this, I thought, well, that's pretty nifty. Um, that really makes, a, that makes the best use of this space. You don't even have space wasted on pathways. I thought, well, there's no way you could do that with soil, but there certainly is. So um, this, um, this is a greenhouse in France, but they're growing in soil. And um, I don't know if you can see the way this has been harvested out. So this greenhouse essentially is planted without a pathway. I guess it has one pathway in the center. Because what this is, they're, they're, this, this grower is a fairly big wholesaler. And so they just plant the whole greenhouse, uh, more or less walk away. Um, I guess it helps because they're using some kind of um, a plastic or something on the floor. And then they just start at one end and they just harvest through the whole house. You know, they just don't mess around with pathways. So. I think that you know, as as ecological or smaller growers, it's our job to think about how 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 we can be efficient. So what if we're not big? Um, we can be um, you know we can be very efficient. You you just want to try to do the most with whatever it is you have. And I've I have a little analogy um, for you that's going to be on the next slide. Okay, so. This is pretty typical. A lot, a lot of years. I actually had a year up there, and but um, I took a, I took the year off of this slide because this is a pretty typical pattern. A lot of years, uh, the United States is the biggest uh, worldwide ag exporter, and a lot of years the Netherlands is number two. But so you know, this is this is a trick picture. Can somebody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Yes, 
I've messed with the scale. So it, here's, a, here's, here's, two, here's a two scale, okay? So, you know, how is, how is the Netherlands here? Um, two thirds the size of West Virginia. How are they? How are they the second biggest ag exporter in the world? So, and I, I hope this is inspiring for those of you who are either small growers or already small growers. I, I, I think I heard uh, during uh, the Connecticut Greenhouse Guys presentation. Uh, can you that a lot of you are are uh, are thinking about getting into greenhouses? Is it is that how many of you are currently growing in a greenhouse or hoop house? Also, a lot of you are already, and, and so I'm, the rest of you are thinking about it. Okay. Uh, so this is designed to be inspiring. My, you know, my point here is not to, um, not to uh, inundate you with the pictures of the big, huge greenhouses and feel overwhelmed. My point is to make you feel inspired because you can do what Holland does, okay? So, so how, how, how are they so outrageously productive with such little land, okay? They make the most of what they have. Uh, you know, efficient use of space, water, fertilizer, energy, labor, everything. They're very shrewd, you know, and, and very businesslike, you know. Greenhouse growing is expensive. Um, in fact, I mean, there's all the fuel, but most of the greenhouse growers I talk to, fuel isn't even their number one cost. So most greenhouse growers I talk to, it's number two. Number one cost is still labor. So, right? So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fuel, there's a lot of labor um, money that has to go into growing. Um, so, the United States is usually the number one ag exporter by growing land extensive crops, right? We're, the things that we're selling, developing a surplus and selling internationally are corn and soy and stuff like that. Uh, so things that take a lot of space and have a relatively low, um, low return per pound. What the Dutch are growing are, they are concentrating on high value crops, right? So fruiting vegetables, leafy vegetables, flowers, and herbs, and stuff like that. So, um, so that's that, that's that's my point, and that's why uh, we're going to talk about this again. But in my book, uh, the book really focuses on um, on eight crops, and we'll talk today. And in the book, you can also talk about how to evaluate how worthwhile other crops are. But what what a focus on in the green in in the book, which is what I noticed after going to greenhouse after greenhouse after greenhouse, they are pretty much all growing the same eight crops which on the, the fruiting vegetable side, they're growing tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and eggplant. And on the leafy vegetable side, they were growing lettuce and greens and microgreens and herbs. And in the herbs, basil, basil had an out, was, an, was an extra important herb. Um, I mean, other herbs too, but basil, basil took the lion's share of all that. So, So what is this Dutch system? So um, the Dutch system is based on, so we're gonna go deeper into all this. This is sort of the slide where I tell you what I'm gonna tell you and then we're gonna talk about it later. But uh, you know, if I, I was starting to think like, okay, what, what is this system that, that is, is, has, uh, has been so successful for greenhouse growing? Uh, systems based on uh, dense spacing. And I'm gonna stop there because once again, trying to boil things down to just their, their more, most simplest or most essential le uh, level. I thought, uh, you know, the more and more I thought about this topic, I thought dense spacing is the keystone for the Dutch system and a lot of systems of, of greenhouse growing. Um, so what I said at the beginning, you know, getting as many plants as you possibly can keep healthy in this, in this precious growing space that you have. So I realized, I think Dutch uh, or dense spacing is the keystone and all the other things on this slide are the things that support growing the crops as densely and as healthily as, as, healthily as possible. So, so um, cause I, I started to think of all the other bullet points on this slide as simply the support to make the, you know, really the, 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 the main idea that you're growing plants as densely as possible in there. And so that's why I have this little sl this slide up here. This is on a, a greenhouse visit somewhere in Canada. You know, you can see from the guy walking in front of me, um, he can really can't almost walk down the, the row with his shoulders um, square. You know, it's, it's so densely planted. You almost have to walk sideways just to get through the aisles. The plants are like 15 feet tall. So they're, they're, they're getting every little bit of sunlight. You know, it's, it's very shady down there on the floor. There's, there's really no sunlight that's being wasted coming into that, that building. So that's, that's why I wanted to, um, to, to have that slide to show you the dense spacing. So, 
Um, so what are the things that hold up that make the dense spacing work? So on our vining fruiting crops, it will be pruning, pruning, pruning and trellising for airflow. Um, using, using greenhouse varieties is, is one thing that may help support it because if your greenhouse varieties either have disease resistances to the greenhouse diseases or there are things, uh, other things about the plant that keep them from getting sick, that's going to help you really pack the, um, pack the greenhouse. Um, so optimizing fertility, no nutrient stress. One, so one, one thing um, is that if you're going to extend the season and if you're going to pack more plants into a given area of greenhouse space than out in the field, you need more fertility, right? Because if you get a, a standard soil, field soil test, they're, they're giving you a fertility recommendation based on a field season, which is not as long. Even if you're not using heat, your season's still longer, that's the whole point, right, than growing them out in the field. So you, along with that, you need to add more fertility um, to, to carry the plants through that extended season. Otherwise, they're going to run out of gas, and they're just going to be weak at, at the end of the season. Uh, so optimizing the climate, obviously, depending on whether you have heat or not, there's, there are different things you can do. But the idea is that they're trying to make the climate um, as friendly as possible for whatever crop they're growing. And of course, that involves knowing what the, what the, the crop wants to do. So that in the book, I have, I have ideal temperature charts for all, all the different crops. So you, have, you know what, the, what temperature they really want to be. Because as a greenhouse grower, that's, that's really your job is making plants happy, right? Because you have so much more control over the plants than out in the field. I'd say one of the important distinctions to make is that in field growing, you, you do want to try to match the plants that you're, you're growing to the environment you're growing them in. That's why, that's why a beefsteak tomato grower in Mississippi would use a different variety than a field-based beefsteak grower in Maine, right? So totally different length of season, totally different diseases and things like that. However, in, a, in, in hoop house and to a greater extent greenhouse growing, what you're trying to do is match your environment to the, the environment that your crop wants to grow in anyway. And so that's why we saw, we saw there's, there was much less variation in um, the varieties that were used uh, in greenhouse growing all over the country than field growing. Whereas, uh, let's take our Mississippi example, um, you might be growing an entirely different field tomato out in Mississippi. Um, growers in the Deep South, in many cases, were using the same greenhouse varieties as, uh, as growers in the Northeast were. They were just trying to tailor the environment to that crop. And, it, and it's worth noting that they are probably also on a different crop cycle um, in, in, uh, in the Deep South than, say, in, in the Northeast here. So um, almost nobody grows actual year-round vining fruiting crops. And so the, um, the, the, the crop cycle used by, by grow, let's say growers who are heating a greenhouse here in the Northeast, they're typically, um, they're typically taking the crop out sometime in December and have at least a month break to, um, to clean out the greenhouse. And, um, and, then, um, and then they'll plant a new crop in January. So growers here in the Northeast who are using the, the longest season. I mean, there are some people who grow year round and try to intercrop in fact, one of them is in my backyard. There's a 42-acre there's a tomato greenhouse called Backyard Farms that's just a, few, uh, just a few miles away from my house. In fact, at night when they, this time of year, because they grow year-round, they have to light the greenhouse. I can see the lights from their greenhouse. It looks kind of like there's a small city, which is how I know there's there, because I live out in the middle of nowhere. There are not really any cities of any size near me. But it looks like there's a small city off in the distance. What it is is when, they, when they're lighting the greenhouse and they don't have their they don't have their energy blanket over it. It, it looks like a, a small city. So here in the Northeast, most growers, I, I wouldn't recommend that though. Don't try to grow year round. Um, I'm not sure if they're making any money. Um, and so here in the Northeast, most growers take off at the very least about a month in the um, between, sometime between November, or sorry, December and January. Whereas in the deep South, they're just flipping that. They're, you know, they're, they're using, they might be using the same varieties. They're just taking a different break because it's so hot in the deep south. They're more likely skipping some part of July, August, or September 
uh, and taking a break during the hottest part of the year. Because even with a, even there, there are some ways you can cool a greenhouse down a little bit, um, swamp cooler or something like that. But um, even with, even with trying to cool a greenhouse, it's just too hot. So, so maybe use the same varieties, but just have a different growing cycle um, in greenhouse growing. So um, grafting, we're going to talk more about grafting. Um, I know um, Steve talked about that a little bit, and, uh, and uh, for tomatoes in particular, I think that's a big deal, and it may, I think it may actually end up becoming a bigger, a big deal for, for other crops. Like, uh, you can graft um, peppers, eggplant, and cucumbers. Not a big deal in this country right now. We'll talk about why that is and, and um, why it may become a bigger deal. Um, augmenting carbon dioxide. So that's, that's one thing that, that most, small, most small growers I do not see doing. But um, that, that's one thing a lot of these, these bigger greenhouse growers are, they're adding carbon dioxide back into the growing environment, which can have a really big uh, impact on growth. Since, um, since of, you know, I think, I think of, I've come to think of carbon dioxide almost like fertilizer that's applied through the air, right? Because if you get a, if you get a greenhouse like this, that is just filled with these huge plants. Um, during the daytime when the plants are photosynthesizing, of course, they need, they're taking in carbon dioxide to, um, to grow. And um, so in a greenhouse like this, or during the sunny part of the day, even in the summertime with all the vents open, the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment inside the greenhouse can actually be considerably lower than the ambient amount of carbon dioxide because the plants are basically in there eating, eating the carbon dioxide up. Now, of course, we're concerned about climate change. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that a lot of the big growers do is they'll buy liquid carbon dioxide and they'll, they will put it out through the greenhouse. Uh, one really uh, promising technology is that, that um, some green, greenhouses now have scrubbers. And so when they burn, um, when they're burning uh, a fuel, they, they can recapture that carbon dioxide, hold it, and deploy it um, when, when it's needed because particularly this time of year, the, the, you know, the biggest time for your heaters to run is at night, and the plants can't use the carbon dioxide at night because it's, the carbon dioxide is only taken up um, when the plants are photosynthesizing. So it, it would not, at the peak times of generating carbon dioxide, it wouldn't do the plants any good. But um, unfortunately, those kind of systems are really only, uh, the carbon dioxide recapture systems are only for bigger greenhouses right now, but I think as um, you know, a lot of the emphasis in, in greenhouse growing right now is on growing more efficiently and growing more, uh, growing more in a more environmentally friendly manner. So I think that as, as, those, um, as those technologies develop, we may see um, carbon dioxide recapture for smaller, uh, smaller growers. So, and the last thing is the, the Dutch have developed some really advanced ways to use climate um, to keep the plants, um, to keep the plants active and and essentially get them to do what, what we want to do. There's sort of some next level climate stuff beyond just keeping the plants alive that we can, we can talk about later. So, um, so let's, first of all, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about dense spacing um, since, since that's a keystone, right? Um, so one of the fundamentals of, of uh, protected growing is just, is just getting more plants in than, than you can get in the field. Um, Obviously, you've got a finite space. The, you know, the more plants you can get in, as long as you can keep them healthy, they're gonna, you're going to make more money. So um, one of the big benefits of greenhouse growing that I think people often overlook is that, that um, the leaves stay dry. And that's, that's one of the main reasons why, um, why you can cram more plants, particularly things like tomatoes, in, um, into, into such a small space. In fact, this, this is a picture from my my hoop house um, uh, a number of years ago when my son was younger, but uh, you can see um, the plants, you're not really seeing individual plants. They're like more like a topiary hedge of tomatoes. They're, they're crammed in there so tight. Um, and you would, if you did this out in the field, you would have all kinds of disease problems. Because obviously there, there's not, there's not if, if those plants got rained on, there's not enough airspace for them to dry off quickly. And a lot of the foliar diseases, you, you're probably aware, tomatoes are susceptible to a lot of foliar diseases. A lot of the foliar diseases um, happen, uh, either need, or, need wet leaves or just worse when the, the foliage is wet. So you'd never be able to get away with a spacing like this um, out in the field. Um, 
so another thing that, that we, we'd already mentioned, but so pruning and trellising helps a lot with these systems, right? Because so trellising, you're, you're making the plant grow up a string, right? So it kind of stays, you say this, you know, each plant has this much area and it's going to stay in that area. I know because I, I, you know, wound a string around it. And then the pruning. Um, here, we're typically talking about taking the leaves off the plant as it grows up. And so um, that is important because the, the place where there's most dead air and the, the air is, is moist is down at the bottom of the plant. Where does the disease start on tomato plants and work its way? These start at the bottom of the plant and work their way up. So the, you know, the quick and dirty idea, uh, you can get more complicated on it, but you know, the basic idea that I use that I talk about in the book is that from the size, you know, from the time that you have fruit starting to size up on your tomato plant, just take all the leaves off uh, below that, that lowest fruit cluster. Um, so the idea is that where, where the, the leaves are, are just, sooner or later, the bottom leaves are going to get diseased. If you start taking the leaves off, let's say when your fruit, first fruit is marble size, doesn't matter. You can, if you have time, you know, the, whenever you see that first fruit, fruit cluster, you can just take the leaves off below that first fruit cluster. But the idea is that if you take the leaves off before uh, whatever fruit cluster is ripening, and you would keep doing this all the way up to the plant, right? So let's say you've picked out your first fruit, fruit cluster, uh, that would be time to take the next three leaves off, right? Because typically tomato plants, um, on indeterminate vining tomato plants, typically have three leaves between each fruit cluster. So the idea is that every time you pick the last fruit on a cluster, take those next three leaves off. And so that's going to give you better airflow uh, where, where the airflow tends to be poor. And also, um, those leaves are going to get diseased sooner or later. Hopefully, hopefully, if you're doing it on that schedule, you're taking them off before they're diseased, right? So that that disease can't spread out. And another thing that's, that's not a huge deal, but especially if you're heating a greenhouse uh, over a long season, it may be. Uh, get, pick, get you an extra cluster or two of fruit is that um, so tomato fruit ripen faster when they're warmer and so if um, if you think about a tomato think about a tomato fruit sitting there on the on the, the fruit cluster if it's surrounded by leaves it's in this cool humid microclimate if you take the leaves off from below that plant it's more exposed it's going to be warmer and also drier because usually, usually rotting on the fruit is not the biggest problem that we have, but definitely times when we've had a lot of botrytis or something else in the greenhouse, botrytis spores can land on the calyx, right? So the little, the little green hat that's on, that when you pick a tomato, the calyx is the little green hat that comes away with the tomato. So botrytis will sometimes land on the calyx and penetrate the fruit that way. So um, having that better airflow can help a lot. And um, in greenhouse varieties, green, ha having, using greenhouse varieties um, can help really with, with all crops, whether they be leafy or, um, leafy or, or vining crops. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I know Steve was talking about whether or not, whether or not it makes sense to, um, to, to use those varieties because greenhouse varieties, of course, are going to be more expensive. So we can talk a little bit about that later. But the way that greenhouse varieties support that dense spacing is because Typically, if you're buying a greenhouse variety, in most cases, it has, it has either different uh, disease resistances, or at the very least, it should have the disease resistances that are important um, in, in a high tunnel. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. But um, so, okay, so you're probably thinking like, okay, so dense spacing, what do you mean by dense spacing? Well, here you go. So this is simply a page. I, this is a, took a, I took a picture of a page out of my book. Um, and so, the idea here is um, this is sort of like the page talking about the, this, the spacings that are pretty standard in the greenhouse industry for all the different crops. So, um, and I'll, I'll say right now, I'm not saying you have to do this exact spacing. This is a starting point. It's a framework for customization. You know, that's, for me, that's the interesting, that's the thing that keeps farming interesting is that no two farms are exactly alike, right? Is that, um, uh, this this is a starting point in a framework. So the way this the way this chart works is that so the brown the brown are the pathways. So this is this is one thing that I noticed after going to visit a lot of these big big greenhouses, they are almost all laid out with three foot pathways and two foot two foot grow, two foot beds. Okay, and so um, 
that and, and so I tried that and and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second but um, so I tried that and and it worked well just because then once I've set once I've set my all my greenhouses up like this with two foot two foot growing beds and three foot pathways for one thing it's simple you know you just you just alternate like that all the way across the greenhouse three foot three foot pathway two foot bed three foot pathway two foot bed and then um, you can plug any crop um, into that um, into that spacing now you know greens are another thing right right now we're going to talk about we're going to talk, talk about leafy crops in just a second but the idea being that 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 layout of three foot pathways and two foot growing beds can accommodate any one of the the vining cr fruiting crops that are commonly grown in protected culture so um, so let's start with tomatoes okay so um, the spacing that I ended up using was um, so okay on I should also say on this chart that the dashed lines are six inches so um, the idea is that um, a lot of these greenhouses uh, that are growing beef steaks they'll have they'll have a stem every foot and they'll and they'll have double rows of tomatoes too so what I do is more like what's in this what's in this picture so the, the, the idea here is the little dot is, is the vine it set is the, the base of a plant and each one of these little lines is is a, a you could call it a vine or a leader or the head of the plant. So what I did is more like this, where I have all these double-headed plants. So I would plant a double-headed plant every foot, right? Because you can see if one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot. So what I ended up on was planting a single row of plants with a plant every foot, right down the middle of the bed. How I got a double row out of that is that every plant has two heads, two leaders, two vines, whatever you want to call them. And so um, even though I only have a plant every foot, I had get two rows with a vine every foot by um, putting one plant to one side and both both heads of the other plant to the, the, the next side. And so, um, so that's the spacing that I like for um, tomatoes. There's a couple different ways to grow cucumbers in, in uh, protected culture. So uh, other other than just letting them run on the ground, which I'm I'm not a fan of because for one thing you're not making it if you let them run on the ground, that's a perfectly fine way to do it. But you've got all this vertical space. You know, the cucumbers are just going to roll roll all over each other on the ground. First of all, I don't like it because the, you spend a lot of time bent over. Think about how big the leaves on a cucumber plant are. Unless you're growing little leaves, you you spend a lot of time bent over shuffling through the leaves. Uh, trying to find cucumbers and also you're not taking advantage of all the space up 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 off the ground so there's there's a couple ways to grow cucumbers um, I'm gonna really so umbrella style um, if you're not familiar with the umbrella style of growing cucumbers um, it's described in the book I also wrote a short article there's a short article that I wrote on growingformarket.com that is that is free and it, you know, if you go to gro growingformarket.com and search umbrella because right, we don't talk about umbrellas a whole lot on Growing for Market. If you just search the word umbrella, you'll find this, this article that I wrote about growing cucumbers umbrella style. The quick and dirty on growing cucumbers umbrella style, what you do is you have a trellis wire in your, in your, your hoop house. You grow the cucumber plant up a string to the trellis wire. Where it hits the trellis wire, you top it. You cut, you cut the, 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 the main growing shoot of the cucumber right off. But you have to make sure to leave you, the idea is that you leave three you leave three shoots right below the wire where you you turn you where you cut the head off of that plant, and you really only want two. But the idea is that if you only if you leave exactly two, you're probably going to accidentally break one of them off. So the idea is if you leave three shoots on there, you're definitely going to have two good shoots because the reason it's called umbrella uh, style cucumber growing is because the cucumber plant grows up to the wire, you top it right at that wire, and then you let a shoot grow out on either side and throw the shoot over the wire. And so it's like an umbrella, right? It grows up and then it comes out like this. And then you let, you let, you get most of the cucumbers actually off of the shoots that are over the wire and the, the, the cucumber will, will fruit for a while. So um, I should stop there because we don't have time to go into that. But like I said, there's, you know, there's How materials. How high is the wire? Um, could be anywhere from six to six or seven feet tall. I mean, that's that's a, that's a good point. There's so more newer greenhouses. They're building much taller, and so it's it's one of the other reasons why I like the umbrella style cute growing for smaller growers is because most you know most people's greenhouses or hoop houses the the purlins are more like probably like more like six or seven feet off the ground. Like like actually our our greenhouses we paid a little bit extra. We we bought our greenhouses from Knowles. 
and we paid, uh, there's a feature, probably not just for Nolts, but there's a feature where you can buy extra long ground posts, because at the, at the time we built those greenhouses, there were a lot of people doing uh, extended season greens at our farmer's market, but there were not a lot of people doing, there was nobody doing extended season fruiting crops. And so, so we really built them for the vining fruiting crops. So we knew we were gonna want that extra space. So our, our greenhouse, the top wire is nine feet. But you know, it, this, this, the umbrella style growing works really well with, um, with a lower wire in the six or seven foot range, um, it, which is in contrast, okay, to the next thing. So this, what I have here, cucumber high wire, so high wire is just what it's called when you grow when you grow cucumbers more like um, more like a tomato, where you grow it with just a single liter up up a line, and you're you're probably also having to lower and lean it um, if if you're growing high wire because cucumbers grow even faster than tomatoes, right? So the point is by like uh, in our in our greenhouse. By the time cucumbers have hit that, the, the head of the cucumber plant has hit the wire nine feet up, we're only just starting to get cucumbers off the bottom. And so you kind of have to, they just out, cucumbers grow so fast. That's, that's kind of a drawback to the, to the high wire style of growing cucumbers because it's, it's a, they grow so fast, it's a lot of labor to be lowering and leaning those cubes. They just grow so fast. So, uh, but if you do, you can, if, if that appeals to you, um, I mean, the, the, the reasons to do that are because with this umbrella style cucumber growing, uh, because you've topped the plant, it, it only, it has a, um, it only, the plants don't have an unlimited bearing. Um, the, the plants essentially, they, they fruit off of all the, um, of all the little vines on, on the umbrella part of the cucumber and then, then they're just done. And so people who are doing umbrella style cukes, I mean, if they're doing it year round, they'll do, three or four crops uh, to cover the whole year. Um, so one, one reason you might wanna do high wire cubes is A, if you're already doing growing like that with tomatoes, it's made, it's a, it's a, the system is very similar to tomatoes and so maybe it's, a, maybe it's easier for you just to do more or less the same thing with your cubes as you're doing with your tomatoes. Um, and you, will, you can potentially, if you keep them healthy, high wire cubes can bear for a very long time. Because so essentially as long as you know, if you really wanted to do the whole year, I mean, you probably, nobody, so nobody does a one, one cucumber crop. Like, like the growers, growers who are really pushing the season, like the, the time frame that I mentioned earlier, where maybe you, you transplant, let's say transplant tomatoes somewhere in uh, January and take them out uh, the following December, they're getting, you know, 10 or 11 months out of one plant. And obviously the, the, here in the Northeast, that involves a lot of heat, not, not necessarily the best model or what I really think smaller growers can be doing, but you know, it's it's a real thing. It's most you know most of the tomatoes in the grocery store are you know those plants are probably 10 or 11 months old uh, by the time that they take them out. So, um, but if you really if you wanted to keep a cucumber crop, if like if you're in a short season area, you know I I've done this. Um, essentially, I grew high wire cubes and then um, we kept them healthy for our whole season. And so our early cukes were our late cukes, but I kind of I'm actually getting I'm actually getting away from it just because it's so much labor to be lowering and lean, leaning those cukes all the time. So uh, although that the recommended spacing on um, cucumbers is similar to tomatoes, so you put a plant in the ground every foot. Most people give most people give their cucumber vines a little bit more space than they do the tomato vines. So instead of having a cuc you put a, a a cucumber plant every foot, and then you have you put one one vine grows to one side, the other vine grows to the other side. So you plant plant a, can plant a plant every foot and still get a double row, but just have a you have a vine every two feet instead of every one foot. You can definitely compress that down. We've planted them closer, uh, even closer than that, with pretty good pretty good luck. Um, peppers, greenhouse peppers. So if you think back to that picture that I showed you, of uh, uh, greenhouse peppers are kind of the king uh, kings of um, of, of tight spacing because um, peppers are such slow growers. What they'll do is they'll really pack them in um, to get the most out of that space. And so the um, like one of the spacings they'll use in greenhouses, which is illustrated here, is they'll put two plants next to each other every foot, and then um, they'll they'll make two they'll make two heads off of each one of those pepper plants, 
So you actually have a pepper, you have, have a pepper vine every six inches. And so that was probably the kind of spacing that they were using in those big greenhouses because to, to pepper plants are much smaller, more compact than tomato plants, and so you can really cram them in. Um, and so you really, do, at this point, you, you almost don't, you know, they don't really look like individual plants. They're just kind of like a hedge. Um, and I should, okay, and so as an example, that reminds me, as an example of how you can customize these spacings, what I found, this is pretty standard. A lot of greenhouse growers use something like this, like a tomato vine every foot with double rows um, in the greenhouse industry. But then um, the growers customize that depending on the time of year. They will, they will um, grow them a little tighter um, depending on the variety. So they, um, uh, okay, so if you've, you've, if you've grown cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes, you know that the foliage on um, grape tomatoes and cherry tomatoes is much smaller leaves, much more wispy foliage than on beef steak tomatoes. And so uh, what I noticed is that the, the greenhouse growers were putting their grape and cherry tomatoes closer together. They had tomato vines closer than a foot. And part of the reason, there's two parts of it. So part of it is because, part of it is because they can, because the foliage is so much, is so much wispier, you can, you can put more plants closer together. And the other part is just out of necessity. Um, anything, on any fruiting crop, um, you will tend to get lower yields per pound on smaller fruited varieties than larger fruited varieties, okay? I mean, it holds true for anything. You're going to get more weight of beefsteak tomatoes than cherry or grape tomatoes. You're going to get more weight of bell peppers than hot peppers or um, chilies or anything like that. So basically, um, growers who are going to grow any of the small fruited stuff, so cherry tomatoes, grape tomatoes, they have to make up for the, um, for the, the re reduction in yield by, um, by trying to get more plants in there since they can with the, the foliage. Uh, and the, the other trick, which isn't really so much of a trick, is just to sell you got to sell the small fruited um, crops by by the piece, and by the piece I mean a container instead of the pound. Because so it's like we just talked about, you're going to get if you're growing cherry and grape tomatoes, you're going to get a lower yield than the beefsteak tomatoes. And so um, if you showed the if you put a price per pound on there, if you showed the customers what you had to get to justify growing them, if you put um, because if you if you put a pint container of cherry or grape tomatoes out there for three or four bucks or whatever it is, uh, people are like okay sure you know I'll buy this pint of cherries for three or four bucks. That's probably pretty competitive pricing. If you said my cherry or grape tomatoes are six dollars or eight dollars a pound or you know whatever whatever that pint container turns out to be, I think people would say six dollars a pound for tomatoes and they wouldn't buy them. So you know there's strategies you have to use to make Make, um, to make the economics work out on the smaller, smaller fruity crops. And so very lastly, um, egg, there's less eggplant growing than all this other stuff. It's, uh, the eggplant is grown pretty, on a pretty similar system to, to the tomatoes with a, a, plant, a plant, plant, plant every foot. But eggplant, because most, egg, most eggplant and particularly greenhouse varieties of eggplant are such strong growers, you can get three heads on each um, eggplant. So you, you can put a, put a plant at the same spacing, so a plant as, as you would for tomatoes, so a plant every foot, but put three, three heads on that plant, and then you'll get, you know, you'll get, uh, the plants can do it, and then, um, and you'll get a, a higher density of vines from the same density of, of plant. So um, we're gonna talk about, more about spacing. I got some pictures from my own farm, um, but we're gonna do it, do it in a minute. Um, okay, and so, so what about the leafy crops? So um, this is a this is a screenshot from a book um, because the the planting density on the greens crops are more determined by um, by the frame size of the plant, right? You can't you can't put a uh, like I always think of black black seeded Simpson. I don't know if you guys know the variety black seeded Simpson. It's a really old. It's been around forever. It's like this huge. It's like this huge leafy uh, green leaf lettuce. And so, you know, the idea, you can't plant black seeded Simpson on six inch spacing in every direction. It's just gonna rot, you know, before, before it gets the size. Um, but that's why, if you, look, if you look in the greenhouse lettuce section of a lot of catalogs, what they tend to be going towards, and for a long time now, this isn't just a recent thing, 
what they tend to be going towards on greenhouse lettuces are these really dense, compact, small framed varieties. They, you know, I think of them, they're almost like lettuce cabbages, you know. They, it's almost like they've got, they've, they've packed uh, like a foot's worth of lettuce into an eight inch or six inch package. Uh, you know, the, the idea there being, um, if you let's let's if you grow if you grew this huge unruly head of black seeded simpson and let's say you know it weighs a pound or something uh, and then let's say you could grow a smaller frame variety you know one that instead of needing a whole foot of space if you could grow a smaller frame variety that'll fit in eight inches or even six inches and has a similar amount of mass your customers are going to be happy with that right they're like wow this thing is dense but you know you got you know however many more heads out of that and so. To get down to the six inch spacing, you do probably have to be using more like mini, you know, mini champs or really a really baby head um, kind of lettuce. But that's, that's why those mini heads are, one of the reasons those mini heads are getting so popular is because this is, this is a numbers game. It's how many, how, many, um, how many plants can you possibly cram into that bed once again? And a bonus, you know, some some markets think of mini heads as you know people want like a big a big head of lettuce. A lot of higher end markets treat the mini heads as a high as a higher value thing. It's like this fancy you know mini mini little head. And so, um, you know, I think I think that um, that growers have realized this, and that's why those those mini heads are starting to get really popular. So let's say so if you had a a, a hundred foot bed. So this is where the numbers really add up. So if you had a 100 foot bed at one foot spacing, you could get 500 plants in there. At eight inch spacing, you could get a um, thousand, a little over a thousand plants in there. At six, six, six inch spacing, you're getting more than three times the number of, of, of lettuce heads in there than at the one foot spacing. So where the numbers really take off is, um, is where you, you think about that whole year. And so this is, this is for somebody who's uh, you know, growing lettuce dedicated, so maybe you're, you know, maybe you're growing lettuce in the cold part of the year, and then you're going out in the field. But you can you can uh, see see what the math is like. So you know, at a buck fifty a head, you know, you're making many many times um, more money. You know, you're making about twice as much as the one foot spacing at eight inch spacing, and then you're making several times what you would have um, at at the one foot spacing uh, with six inch spacing, and then um, over. So I I just ran this. Let's say you know, a lot of lettuce growers can get 10, 10 crops a year. If you don't even have to put a whole lot of heat in there, even with a little bit of heat, you could maybe get 10 crops a year. So you know, I just multiplied everything by 10, and then then that's where the uh, that's where the numbers, the difference in the numbers gets really big. So let's even just say, let's just say you okay, say okay, I don't have a market for baby heads of lettuce. My customers would only pay me half as much. All right, well if we have the value, half the retail value of the six inch lettuce, you're still at 13, 13, five, thirteen thousand $13,500. So even if you could only get half as much for the six inch uh, the heads of lettuce that you could plant at six inch spacing, you're still making um, about twice as much um, as if you could get $1.50 for heads planted at one foot versus 75 cents for heads planted at six inches. Um, so I just wanted to show you that, how the, how the spacing applies to, to greens crops. Y yeah, question? This, this is just, I think this was calculated a bed of four, four feet wide, four feet wide and 100 feet long. So it's, I, didn't, I didn't, this is just looking at one bed unit. This is not, you know, this, this is the, so this, like this, you could get 500 heads of lettuce in a four foot wide bed that's 100 feet long. So, so this is just, this is just for, Yeah, I mean it doesn't. I think you get similar. You mean like whether it's staggered planting versus straight across? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I guess it's eight, eight in every direction. So these, yeah, these, these. These numbers were planned from a bed, you know, it's like eight inches in every direction from, from another plant. So, but I mean, once again, this is a framework, you know, you can, 
you can use different different numbers, different you can stagger them, you can plant straight. The you know the whole idea is that you know if you're planting things closely, it's just you're getting a lot more um, out of any any given bed. Sure. The height of those is the ideal height for a green light. Seven feet or Going to balance the labor it takes for putting up a ladder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. His his question was the of what the ideal height yeah. for a greenhouse in here in Northeast. Are we talking tomatoes or vining fruiting crops in general? Yeah, it's just in the run, summer crop of the vining fruiting crops. Kind of looking to run up. Yeah. Do you want to balance the labor? Yeah. Um, I would say so. His, the question is. What what's the ideal height for a greenhouse? Um, the greenhouse guy in the back might have a. He, you should go ask him. But but I would say I like anywhere from seven to nine feet because um, because y yeah you're not doing that much. Um, you're 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 not doing that. You don't have to get on a ladder or anything like that. I mean when with our nine foot wires. The nine foot wires are nice just because uh, we used to lower and lean our tomatoes and we've actually gotten away from that just because it's so much labor to lower and lean them. And the other thing is that um, what we started to do was just top the tomatoes when they hit that top wire. And so, but I think that, I mean, I think that range of seven to nine, roughly seven to nine um, foot range is not, there's not too much, or at least for us, there's not that much stretching. Like I would actually get one of those old libraries Tools, you know the thing, the ones they they roll around, but when you step on them, they compress and you can stand on them. So I would get a library stool and I would just kind of kick it down. You know, I would be working on plants and just kick it down the row and then get on it if I need to do something high, and then you know keep kicking it down the row. So there's there's little solutions like that, just easy easy little stools and things. Uh, I mean the other so the other thing about that is what I what I also realized. So one of the things I talk about in the book is that. Um, whenever you're two months out from the end of your season, you should top all your tomatoes because especially for large fruited varieties, it takes at least 60 days. So you see, you see a tomato blossom there on the vine. It's going to take at least 60 days for that blossom to go to a right tomato. If you're less than 60 days, if you're 60 days or less from the end of your season, you know, you can look at that flower. 60 days from the end of your season, say that flower is never going to turn into a ripe tomato. There's no point in my tomato plant continuing to put energy into this flower if I'm never going to pick it. And so, so the other reason we got away from lowering and leaning is because we realized, at least in our climate, we plant, you know, we would plant an unheated hoop house in about the third week of May. And then what we noticed is that our, our, our tomato plants would be hitting the top wire at nine feet off the ground at around the end of August. And so I know just from experience, even if even if the even if the plants in an unheated hoop house in my area haven't been killed outright by frost, they're not really going to do much else beyond mid mid October or so. And so I can count forward and say, okay, it's the end of August. If end of August to end of September, end of September to end of October. So so end of August is 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 about two months from the end of my season. Whether you know without heat, that's when it's just going to end. And so. So what I realized was we're putting all this energy into lowering and leaning the tomatoes that we're probably not going to pick. It depends a little bit. Hotter years, they get up there faster, but still, for us, it was a good, it was overall a good thing to just say, let's save the labor. Maybe we miss out on a tomato or two or something like that, but at least, we, at least we're not out there lowering and leaning the tomatoes every single week um, like they do in bigger greenhouses. So that's... One more question, is that right? Yeah, sure. With the peppers and eggs, it goes in an unheated... Those versus, um, oh, that's a good question. So his his question is with the peppers and eggplants. Um, does it make sense to trellis them up tall, the the way that you would with the tomatoes instead of basket weaving them or Florida weaving? Um, that's a good question because I actually, I forgot to say there was something I meant to say about peppers the first time around, and your your question is getting at it. And so, um, so. My answer to whether it makes sense to um, to trellis the, the peppers and eggplants up tall instead of basket weaving them, my answer is it depends. So 
Um, the, the, only, the only time that I think that it makes sense to grow peppers like a, a, a tall up a string like a tomato is if you're, if you're putting a, if you're heating them. Because we did a fair, um, it, we did a fair amount of studies on that at Johnny's trying to get, basically what, it, what we wanted to know is if we could get those, those, uh, the peppers like you saw in the big greenhouse pictures to grow up tall. Uh, and so those peppers are also being pruned a lot. Um, in an unheated situation, and we never had success with it. I think one of the things is just peppers are so much weaker and so much slower growing than than um, than tomatoes that if they didn't have the supplemental heat, um, they just wouldn't work out. We got we got it to work out and grew very nice trellis peppers up a string in heated greenhouses, but we found that without heat, they just don't grow tall enough to make it worth all that effort effort to effort to grow them up a string. So what I'd recommend my alternate spacing. What I would say. If you don't have heat, don't do this. Just grow peppers at a normal, a more normal bushy spacing. I think two, two rows is still, still a good idea. All these crops, because if you think about it, if you plant a crop, you know, just a single row of tomatoes, and I have some pictures on my farm when we did that. If you plant just a single row, uh, then you've got, you've, got bed, you've got pathway on both sides of, each, of every single row of crops. If you can double row everything, then you've got half of, you've got a, a ratio of half as much pathway to, to each row of crop as if when you're single rowing. So I still think it's a good idea to plant double rows of peppers. And, but if, if you don't have heat, you can just let them bush out and either they may support themselves. That's another thing. If they're, if they're growing in double rows on a two foot or so bed, they may support themselves a little bit, or you can throw stakes in there and do, you could basket weave them, or I've also just thrown some short stakes around the outside of a bed and just put string sort of like at levels around the outside of the bed, which just kind of contains them and keeps them from flopping in, into the pathways. Because to get, to get peppers to grow up super tall, like in the pictures, they're doing a lot of pruning on them. So for one thing, they're, they're, what they're doing, uh, where typically where a pepper plant gets its first flower is called the split. You may have noticed this, where the first flower on the pepper plant is, is where it goes from being a single stem plant to a double stem plant, and so in this country they'll usually they'll usually leave um, maintain those two those two branches that form at the first flower. They'll make those the only branches all the way up, and it's more like a tomato plant. You know how you know how on you know, a tomato plant you pick you pick the, the the vine or vines that you want to be your main vines, and typically people on indeterminates pull all the rest of the suckers off. Well, that's they basically are growing a pepper a pepper that way. Um, uh, they, you know, they pick that those two vines and, and grow it that way. You can also do four heads. It's like in in North America, it's a lot more common to do two heads because Americans like big produce. And you you know, when you have a pepper plant with only two vines per plant, you get bigger peppers. In Europe, a lot of times they do they actually do four heads. So they take that first split and they let it split a second time, and they just maintain the four the four liters because they they, they end up using less plants, but the peppers are a little smaller. American market likes the bigger peppers, so so um, that uh, that's the answer on the peppers and the eggplants. Although eggplants, I would say it's more. I think eggplants are more worthwhile for growing up a string because eggplants are a lot a lot stronger growers. So you could, you know, once again, this is this is where it kind of depends on your own production style. If you hate trellising, I'd say then then you know then you could grow you could grow eggplants in a greenhouse more like a bush style as far as you know not doing all the pruning. Because to get to get any of these crops to really grow up the string, string right, in addition to actually stringing them, the trellising part, there's the pruning that goes along with it to to maintain uh, that particular leader that you have clipped to a string. So um, eggplant, I think, is still more worthwhile. We had we had pretty good luck growing eggplant trellis up a string in unheated hoop houses because it is so much stronger of a plant than peppers. But once again, I, I mean, this is definitely, these are the ideas, these are framework. If you hate trellising and pruning, um, there's, there's, you know, then you could just, you could choose to grow them more of a bush style. I mean, they'll still grow, uh, yeah, and basket weave them or something like that, because they'll still grow faster. You'll still get more, more in a greenhouse. Um, uh, I mean, same, same thing, you know, same thing for tomatoes. Uh, I think it was Steve was talking about growing the, were you talking about growing BHN 589? Yeah, this is actually, so I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question because I glossed over a few things that probably shouldn't have been on this, um, on this diagram. Um, you know, I, I like, I, I actually kind of like trellising and pruning. It's sort of like my, it's like meditative for me. 
But my, my wife hates it. You know, she compares it to orchard work. We have some good friends who have apple orchards. They're just like out there pruning all the time. And it's the kind of thing you got to either love that kind of work or find somebody else to do it or else you're going to hate life. So, um, so, you know, I would say I like doing those things. If I go in and, you know, do a nice job pruning my greenhouse, I feel like I've put the world in order and, you know, we can move on. Whereas if, you know, it is tedious and it's time consuming. I think it's not at all a bad idea. Like I really like that variety that Steve mentioned, VHN 589. That's the best variety that I've seen if you want to do bush production of uh, tomatoes in, in a hoop house. And so that's a really good option. It's actually to use a spacing very much like this. You, you know, you could use a spacing, you could plant double rows. Um, I wouldn't plant them down the middle. What, I, what I've seen growers do with VHN 589 uh, is to plant tax instead of, uh, so because this, this recommendation here is for indeterminate tomatoes, right, where they're vining and you're actually pruning and keeping them to two liters. Uh, with with a determinate tomato like BHN 589, I just keep saying BHN 589 because it's not really the company that developed it. BHN, which is down in Florida, terrible names I know, but you know they um, they don't even bill it as a hoop house tomato. Growers have just noticed it just grows unusually well in hoop house, and so because the thing is because most of the most of the growers uh, the most of the big greenhouse growers in North America are growing indeterminate tomatoes. Um, that's why most of the tomatoes that are billed as greenhouse tomatoes are indeterminate. Because think about it, if you're a seed company, you're in, in the, the, you know, the, the most volume of what you're, you're growing is to going to one segment, then, you know, you're going to breed for that segment. And so that's why, that's why there, there are lots of greenhouse tomatoes out there. Almost all of them are indeterminate is because just most of the big greenhouses are doing it. But if you want to save a little bit of labor, or a lot of labor, actually, you know, it's a really, it's a really good solution to plant, um, plant BHN 589s in a double row. So you could do maybe, maybe a foot, maybe 18 inches. Or you play with it, you know, um, depending on, you know, this is one of the things we'll talk about a little bit more, but depending on how good your ventilation, and all that other stuff is, some of those closer space, if you plant, if you plant the plants at really close spacing and you don't have good ventilation, you may end up with disease problems. So play around with that spacing. But, you know, my suggestion would be if you want a basket weave stuff in a greenhouse, plant a double row of something like BHN 589 and, um, and, uh, and just, just do a double row and do, do a double row and do a double, do two basket weaves. You know, in a scenario like this, you would end up, you would have a basket weave fence right here on the edge of the bed and you would have one here. So you'd, you would have two basket weaves corresponding with your rows of tomatoes roughly two feet apart. So, what, Steve, what, what kind of spacing do you use on BHN 589? If we're doing it in a foot, then we have done it in a foot, but it was a little tight. Yeah. 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 We would plant them in June, mid to our late tomato, kind of after you think about it. Yeah. So they'd be more productive than our BHN by far, by far. By far like, yeah. By and then, but and you said you were doing single row though. Single row. And yeah. We would do a companion basil. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So so Steve's doing single row, but that was his. He was companion planting with basil. So so I mean that's a you know I really like the double rows, but I'm like like I'm saying you know this is I'm not saying don't be like oh you know I'm doing it because I saw that guy do that presentation about it you know you know maybe maybe maybe. Maybe you don't like the double rows, but you know, getting the basil in there is a way to, to get a little more value out of that row, right? You know, your tomato plants are pretty healthy. He said he's planting them at 18 inches instead of a foot, so you know, you can give the tomato plants a little more space because BHN 589, you know, is 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 a unusually tall. You know, it's bushy and it's also I, I think I can't remember if they they categorize it as actually as a as a as a semi-determinant. But um, to me, it's you know it's it's like it's very tall for for a determinate tomato, and so he's he's got single rows planted tomato plants at 18 inches, and he's got basil in there too. So he he's, sounds like you're you know you're doing that. You're you're getting uh, you, you you're trying to get the most value, right? Precious real estate. You're trying to get the the most. Sounds to me like you're getting you're probably doing it. You know, you're getting getting a lot of value out of that. You're not pruning all the leaves off like I'm. Right. Good point. Yes. Yeah. So his question is, you're not you're not pruning all the leaves off, and yeah, that's a good that's a good point about these determinants. That's that's why you're going to save so much labor with determinate tomatoes because instead of instead of doing taking every single sucker off the plant, keeping having to work on them every week to keep them to the string, 
a lot of growers prune. Um, a lot of growers will do a teeny bit of pruning on determinants and just take just take the leaves off below um, below the first flower, just just to create once again create a little bit more airflow at the bottom of the plant. It's kind of optional. Some growers do that. Some growers don't. I don't think it's a bad idea. You could always use airflow down there at the bottom of the plant, but it's very important not to do not to do extensive suckering on your determinants because the determinant tomatoes only have so many places where they're going to bear fruit. If you pruned it, if you pruned a determinant tomato, took all the suckers off the way that you pruned an indeterminate vining tomato, you would have you would take a lot of your your blossoms off before they even formed. You, you would have low, a lot lower yield. Can you explain the Right. You don't. You don't. Okay, that's a good. So to get the two, so the, the leaders only are only for indeterminate. Okay. Like I don't know, big diener. Like the you know, like if you look in most greenhouse catalogs, look at all the tomatoes. The ones that are listed in the greenhouse section are all indeterminate. Usually, so this the two liter thing is only for indeterminate. This is this, the idea is that with the determinants, you're not doing all that pruning. You're not limiting it to two liters. Oh, you're still trellising. Yeah, but what you can do is is uh, like this guy mentioned uh, that you do you can do you can do the bas you know what we call basket weave or Florida weave. Yeah, you can basically set up a little fence and just add add you know add an, another layer of string um, to 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 your you know put a like put a stake every two or three plants or something like that. And then put an, put another level of string on every week or whenever they grow about a foot or so, and it just keeps it basically makes a tomato fence. You know? Yeah. Question is: Is there any benefit to string trellising versus net trellising? I w I wouldn't say so necessarily. I mean we. Usually, what we did was to put to grow them up a string in the greenhouse, and then I'll, one thing we kind of did uh, a variation on outside is we would put up a long net, like well, you're talking like Hortanova, like that Hortanova is that white netting that people use a lot. So yeah, that's what we did is we we our field system evolved into we just put would put posts in the ground, a uh, steel T post. We drilled a hole through the top of the T post. We would string a wire all the you know a wire all the way down all those T posts and weave a piece of Horta Nova into it. And so the idea was that, um, well, part of it is because we got completely away from growing large fruited tomatoes out in the field. And so the only thing we were left growing out in the field were cherries and grapes. And so, you know, usually we would, for the first part of the season, we would just keep up with the pruning on the cherries and grapes. And then later on, we would just get busy and they would just kind of go, you know, we would, we would kind of let, it. I mean, it was sort of like a planned, a planned, uh, uh, I don't know, catastrophe is too strong of a word, but basically our idea was that we would keep up with the pruning on the cherries until we just got too busy. And then by, the, by then the plant was strong enough because there's not a lot of fruit load on cherry and grape tomatoes. They would just develop tons of suckers and they would be covered with a lot of fruit. So, I mean, I think, I think string trellising versus net trellising is more, it's just kind of like what you prefer. You know, either one is... No, that's a good point. We did have to, we would go out there with uh, like sisal twine or something like that and essentially, and um, and we would tie a piece of twine every in, in uh, every few feet and, and we would essentially tie them back. So, yeah, so yeah, her question was, was did they did they go through the vine well enough? And so we, we kind of tried that. We were trying to sort of like weave them in, but what we found is it just, it just took, it was a lot quicker just to take a piece of twine out there and just tie it every once in a while and just sort of like tie the tomato plants. We're basically like tying them back to a fence. It was just more time effective. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 took, we took everything apart and reused everything. I mean, that's definitely, definitely one of our orientations is there's way too much plastic in ag and we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to, you know, where we're using plastic, we're trying to reuse it much as possible. Yeah, here we are. Okay, so, so which crops to grow? Um, so why, so this is, you know, this is what I just noticed. After going to all these different greenhouses, most of the big commercial greenhouses are focused on these eight crops. And 
like Steve was saying, you know, obviously people are going to grow other crops in greenhouses. There's some certain value to be put on diversity. You know, if you're a CSA farm or even a market farm for that matter, your customers don't want to get the same thing in the box. They don't want to see the same thing on the table every single week. So particularly for smaller farms, you know, there's definitely sometimes reasons to grow other things in here. Um, but I just noticed every single big commercial greenhouse that I went to, they were doing, um, you know, on the vining side, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and eggplant. On the leafy side, lettuce, greens, microgreens, and herbs. Um, they're hitting those crops because, um, okay, a couple reasons. For one thing, all these crops cannot be stored, so there, there has to be a constant supply. There's year-round demand, right? People want to have a salad in January. Um, the other thing of, of all these crops, the production and value are high enough to pay for the investment in labor and um, the structure and the heat and everything if you're heating. Um, and there's one final thing. All of these crops either have a very long production size cycle with multiple harvests or they have a very short production cycle so they can be relay crops, right? Okay, so, so uh, and this is where I'm going to say if there's other crops, th th this most of the crops that, that pay for themselves on their own outside of, say, having diversity or some, the value that they may contribute as diversity. So most of the crops that pay for themselves in a greenhouse fit into one of those two production cycles. So let's just think about that really quickly. So on the tomatoes, okay, so you may have, you may have been taking care of your tomato seedling for, oh, I don't know, two months before you even put it in the greenhouse. It may need to grow for an additional two months uh, before you ever pick a right fruit, right? So Let's say uh, with your tomato, tomato plants, you may have invested four months of care and labor in that plant before you pick a single fruit. But you might, you know, if you really wanted to, you could pick that plant for nine months in a greenhouse system. So the t things like all those vining fruiting crops, tomatoes, peppers, et cetera, they end up paying for themselves because there's, there's a lot of upfront investment, but you can pick them for nine months. Or, I mean, a lot of you are probably not going to heat a greenhouse that much, much, but still, you know, you pick them for July, August, September, potentially part of October. So, you know, you, you might have them in the greenhouse for two months before you give them in, they give you anything. But even in an unheated hoop house around here, I think you could probably, if you keep the plants healthy, you could pick them for four months. So they pay you back for, the, for all the upfront investment. Um, the, other, the other cycle here is the one of, um, is, is many quick crops, right? Like the, uh, heads of lettuce, microgreens take that example to an extreme, right? Where you have extremely uh, packed, you know, the plants are extremely packed, and you know, with the quick, quick growing ones, you might harvest them every two weeks or something like that. But so a, a less extreme growing cycle is is lettuce. You know, if you're doing lettuce from transplants, you might be able to pick, you know, pick a, you know, put it in the ground and pick a crop, give or take a month, right? So. Um, lettuce, you don't have as much upfront investment, but you, you can have so many, you know, you can harvest so many crops over the course of the season. That's, that's how they pay back. So um, notable exceptions is like winter squash, potatoes, things like that. Um, I remember one time at Johnny's, we did an open greenhouse day and somebody, you know, I was like, hey folks, you know, what, what do you want to talk about? And people were like listing their questions and one person was like, Let's, I want to talk about growing winter squash in a greenhouse. And I was like, I didn't know how to say like, I would discourage that, but um, you, you know the, the point being, crops like winter squash and potatoes, they take up a lot of space. They grow. They need to grow for a long time, and at the end of it, you get one harvest and you're done. Um, and they can be stored, right? So there's so field crop. So so the you know what I would encourage you to do is crops like that, crops like potatoes and winter squash, just grow them out in the field. And if you want to have them for a long season, just invest in some good storage. Uh, some good storage. In fact, in this month, the January, uh, the February growing for market that just came out today, we have a great article about long term, uh, about planning for long term winter vegetable storage. Um, so, you know, my, my um, that, you know, that's why those crops don't tend to be competitive because there's, there's people with stored vegetables that are, that are selling them year round. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about some of the specifics. Um, of this, of, of all this stuff that we've already been talking about, the generality. So, um, increasing planting density can increase yield. Duh. But so I like, I really like this picture because this is this is from the year that we that we built um, this particular hoop house, and uh, was in I don't even remember. It's a number of years ago. Um, geez, 
2011. So this was in 2011. So we just built this hoop house, and um, this is how we. So this is how we used to grow. So this this is a uh, actually it's like what you were talking about the 30 by 48. Um, I know you you said you have some longer ones too. This is a 30 30 by 48 hoop house, and so um, when we started out, we planted five rows. We would plant five rows of tomatoes in a 30 foot wide hoop house with with a a double leader plant a, a foot apart um, down the row. And so um, after so after seeing um, all the big what all the big greenhouse growers were doing, this is how we grow now. And it's kind of fuzzy. I need to find a better picture because so uh, Steve was talking about the Horta Nova or the sorry not the Horta Nova the ProtectNet. This is this picture is taken through ProtectNet because I put I put ProtectNet on the end the end vents um, of some of my houses. And so it looks really fuzzy, but so you can see now. These are like we're, we we got to a fully double the the spacing um, that we we started out with. We went from uh, a single row of tomatoes um, at a foot apart to a double a double row of tomatoes a foot apart, and um, so that doubled everything. So so these are typically what we do is is one house we would grow tomatoes, one house we would grow cucumbers, and just switch them back and forth. That was kind of our lame crop rotation. But um, so between uh, once we we doubled the number of plants, we uh, not entirely surprisingly we doubled uh, we doubled our yield of tomatoes. So it's a, a house like this, we went from getting more like a ton of tomatoes out of a house like this to getting two tons of tomatoes out of a house like this. Um, so um, which which seems obvious, like oh we doubled the number of plants, we got double the amount. Some people. You know, you never know. I mean, the idea is, are the plants getting enough light? Are they are they healthy enough to double? And so I'd say, with all the supporting stuff that we're gonna, we've already talked about a little bit, and we'll continue talking about all these supporting practices to keep the plants healthy at that density. We were able to actually double double the amount of um, tomatoes we grew. And I'm not even saying this is. I'm not saying that's a great number or something like that. That's just what we did. You could definitely get bigger. You could definitely get more than that. So, for example. Um, a, a lot of the ways, a lot of the times, what we did, if we had five double rows of tomatoes, we would do two two double rows of grafted greenhouse tomatoes, two double rows of of grafted heirloom tomatoes, and then one double row of of uh, grafted cherries and grapes, simply to get have early cherry and grape tomatoes. So if I were solely for, focused on yield, what I would do is I would kick the row of cherry tomatoes out of there because they're never gonna they're not gonna yield as much as the beef steaks. Uh, if all I cared about is yield, I would kick the heirlooms out of there because we usually, usually our heirloom production is like half of what we get out of the grafted greenhouse tomatoes. And so if we were using more heat and stuff like that, um, in fact, some of these greenhouses, I mean, like most farms, ours is evolving. This greenhouse, we added a heater to this one and different things. But um, it, I, I've heard a lot of growers say they get more like two thirds of the yield off of their heirlooms that they do off of, of greenhouse tomatoes. So still not a great number. So if all I cared was about was poundage, I'd kick the heirlooms out and grow all greenhouse tomatoes. Now, um, at the time w when we were doing the farmer's market, we um, some of our customers really liked the heirlooms. And, and so I liked the heirlooms, right? So you kind of got to do something that makes you happy. Also, we had we were we were uh, the, you know the earliest at our farmers market with the heirlooms, right? So I figured I figured some people would I kind of looked at them as a loss leader. I'm kind of scared to pencil out exactly the numbers, but you know I thought of them as a loss leader as far as somebody would come into our stand for the the cherry to, or the the heirloom tomatoes and hopefully pick up a bag of salad mix and a bunch of carrots while they are at it, right? So you know the idea there is I'm not saying like this is like the greatest yield in the world something to aspire to. That's what we got, and you could definitely get more or less. Um, so. When you said you went from one row to double, what you're doing, you started off with the one row, two liter, then you're going to rows within that two point span spacing, where you're doing, if you showed in your, your diagram, is just one row, but double liters going off in different directions. Right? Mm -hmm. You actually are planting two plants in that two point. Yeah, so I guess we, we what we're 
we would evolve to just plant, plant, we plant a single row, but what we do is every other plant goes to, so we, we end up with gro a growing double row because we have two, we, so we have two wires over the top. So I guess what it actually is. You're not doing two rows of plants. No, but you, some people do. Some, actually, we evolved, the, the first year that we did it, we actually planted two rows, and what we realized is we had, we actually planted two rows to get two rows, right? You know, like one, you know, one here and one here. What we realized, we had a lot of weed growth between the plants, and so we just, we just smushed all the plants. Instead of planting two rows, we put them all into a row so we could put, we could put landscape fabric or something like that. Exactly, because since we're splitting them, you know, they're actually, they're planted at a higher density than you'd ever want them to grow at. And what happens is we, you know, we send, even though these plants are plant, the stems are really too tight, but one plant goes to the left, one plant goes to the right. That's how we plant a single row and with two wires, you know, we train, we get a double row out of a single single row planted. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've got. I got. That's a great question. I've got some fertility slides here coming up. I'm not sure what I mean. What do you? Well, you were saying double row versus single. You're doing a single row. One row each side. Like planting them, but on the top of green up is two wires. So every other plant is trained using the strings to the wires. One wire on one side, one wire on the other side. Yeah. Two liters. Two liters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so like I was talking about, I have those two foot growing beds. What I, you know, basically I have I have two wires going over the over the trusses in the greenhouse that are two feet apart. So I can plant the plants in a single row, but every other plant, one plant goes to the the wire on the right, one plant goes to the wire on the left. So I can put a single row of plants in the ground and not have to deal with so many weeds and end up getting a, a you know two separate okay. rows of tomatoes. That's different than what you're. What your picture was, and you were showing how you planted. Is part of the problem mm -hmm. that you went from one row with two liters, and now you're talking about originally you're talking about two rows with a single liter. No, no, that's what this. So these, this, so this is, so see these dots are the the where the plants. So see the plants. This is where the plant is actually put in the ground. So see they're all put in the ground, right down the center of the row, and these, this each one of these these little lines here is a vine. So this is how, see how this plant, both of its vines are going over to this side. This plant, both of its sides are going to this side, et cetera. So they're planted in a single row, but you get to, you, this, you know, there's a wire here, there's a wire here, and half the plants go to the left and half the plants go to the right. So you can plant a single row and get a double row. That's, we're here to talk about this stuff, you know. <laughs> All right, so one really simple thing is just to keep records, you know, keep records of everything you can measure, yield, the amount sold, you know. Okay, because this is, and this is one thing um, that, that the Dutch growers do. They keep records of everything. And it's getting easier and easier with all the little, you know, weather, weather sensors that will just, will just met, you know, send a report every once in a while. It's not like you even have to go out there and take the temperature. You know, you can get these little data loggers that will just, will just, um, will, will keep track of what's going out there. So, you, you know, the, p the point is you got to keep records. Well, for one thing, if you're certified organic, you probably have to keep some of these records anyway for your organic certification. Um, the other thing is that you want to be able to develop a record of what's going on in your structures, so that you can, you can look back over time. Like you might say. Um, you might look at be like, oh, it seems like production's really bad. And you know, you look at last year at the same time of year and you realize, oh, you know, it's been, it, we were having a heat wave this right now. Um, and it's been, tri it's been triple digits last week. And so the, the plants are stressed out. So they're not, they're not cranking them out. Um, but you wanna be able to correlate what's going on inside your greenhouse, have a little weather station, uh, correlate what's going on outside of your greenhouse to what's inside. And um, you know all this stuff. 
take, keep track of what you took to market, what you actually sold it for, how many, how many of what you grew actually got sold versus composted and stuff like that, right? Because this is, you know, is, especially if you're heating, but even if you're not, even if you're not heating that crop, you're going to have a lot of labor materials and everything tied up in it. You want to make sure it's paying, paying for itself. So, um, all right, variety selection. We, we, we've touched on this a little bit, and this is where we're going to get into it a little more. So why, so I, my abbreviation, so PC is for protected culture. So I, I like the word protected culture because to some people, greenhouse means a heated structure and a hoop house is an unheated structure. When I'm just talking about all the types of structures, I just like to say protected culture because um, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't uh, leave anybody out. So, um, um, so what, what, so, so like Steve mentioned, those, those greenhouse varieties are more expensive. So for one thing, they're all bred in greenhouses and it's more, it's more expensive you know, place to do breeding. For another thing, there's a much smaller, there's a much smaller market for the greenhouse seeds than, than a field seed. You know, like so a company breeds a, a field cucumber, they're going to sell millions, if not billions. You know, if, if it's a popular variety, people are going to plant it everywhere. They're going to sell millions and billions of seeds. If they plant, if they breed a greenhouse cucumber, so not only was it bred in the more expensive real estate, but there's a much, there's fewer people doing greenhouse growing than, than field growing. And, and growers are also more likely to keep a, a greenhouse cucumber plant healthy and alive for a lot longer. You know, you're going to keep a greenhouse cucumber plant healthy for several lifetimes of, of a field uh, cucumber plant. So um, that's, why, that's why they're more expensive. Whether it's worth that is up to you to decide. But what, so what they're breeding them for, though, is um, so on the leafy, on the leafy um, varieties, like we talked about, is that they're, they're bred to be very um, compact and dense. So you kind of get, you know, the way I look at it is you get a foot, foot worth of plant and eight inches worth of space. Um, so the breed, you know, that's what the breeding is for on the leafy crops. Um, one thing on the, the vining fruiting crops is they're, they're bred to be compact but also, also open. Like uh, they call it intranode length, like the, the length between between leaves along the stem. So the idea is they want to they want vining fruiting crops to be compact, right? So they're not they, they um, so they don't um, so they can be crammed in, like we've been talking about, as as tight as possible. But they still want kind of an open canopy because one of the things that keeps those leaves healthy is have some air through airflow through the, the canopy. So um, compact and open. Um, all greenhouse crops are, should be being bred to be resistant to common the pr common protected culture diseases like leaf leaf mold came up in Steve's presentation I think uh, to my to my mind leaf mold is like the poster child for um, for tomato greenhouse diseases uh, what, why I think that is because you almost never see leaf mold out in the field and after someone's bred uh, someone's been doing greenhouse growing in a certain place you almost always see it in um, greenhouses. So I know my structures were this way. You kind of get a honeymoon with leaf mold because it is a, it is such a dedicated disease of protected culture. Um, like on my farm, I think for the first two or three years, we didn't have any leaf mold. We could grow tomatoes that didn't have resistance, no problem, the heirlooms and all that kind of stuff. And then maybe in the third, maybe we started to see a little bit of it in the third year and by the fourth year, we just had leaf mold. Because it's a spore-based disease, it, once, once you have it, you pretty much have it. It's almost impossible to get rid of all the little spores of leaf mold uh, once, once it's showed up on your farm. So, um, and so um, that's what I mean by uh, poster child for, for greenhouse diseases because you almost never need it as a resistance out in the field and you almost always need it in a resistance in um, protected culture growing. For example, um, when I was working at Johnny, sometimes we get catalogs that didn't say whether the tomatoes were for greenhouse or field growing. Sometimes we would get catalogs from Asia or something that were in a language that I couldn't read. But if I could read the disease resistances, if I saw leaf mold on a tomato, I knew that it was most likely bred with, um, with greenhouse growing in mind because, um, because, uh, because that's, that's where it's important. Um, so all crops want to have whatever the diseases of heat and humidity are, right? Because it's, Gonna, it's going to be hotter and probably going to be more humid in a, in, a, a, uh, in a greenhouse or hoop house, right? So, so of course, they try to put diseases, uh, heat and humidity kind of disease resistance into greenhouse and hoop house crops. Um, downy mildew is a good example for lettuce, right? Um, 
in, in lettuce. Uh, lettuce in greenhouses is very susceptible. You get downy mildew when it's, it's really moist in the kind of temperature conditions you, you tend to have in a greenhouse. In fact, I, I, if I'm rem remembering correctly, uh, you know, they have all the different greenhouse uh, lettuce blends and things like that. I think the criteria that I forget, what is it, five, the five-star blend that Johnny's has, and I'm not, I'm not rep repping for Johnny's up here, you know, I have no interest, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying theirs is better than anybody else's, but if, remem if memory serves, the, the idea was that every, to be in that greenhouse lettuce blend, the lettuce plants had to have, whatever they were blending into it, had to have downy mildew. Because the last thing you want is to go out plant plant your lettuce greenhouse lettuce blend, and it's all beautiful, and one of the, one of the varieties is sliming down, right? Because you're gonna you gotta cut, you know, if you're doing baby leaf, you gotta cut all those varieties together, and you're gonna have three beautiful varieties mixed in with one rotting one, not not very beautiful. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing is most most of the greenhouse lettuces have downy mildew, and if you're trying to I mean, you'll probably learn this from experience if, if, if it's a problem, because if you plant lettuces that don't have it and it's a problem for you, it's going to show up. So, you know, my, my point is don't take it from me. Um, do a little trial. Um, you, you know, there's, find out if those varieties have the value on your own farm, because some of those, some of the greenhouse tomatoes are really expensive. In fact, we're doing, we, We've actually changed our focus a little bit on my farm. We're doing a lot more. We took we took over someone else's nursery business, and I'm trying to build a bigger greenhouse to get more in, to focus more on a wholesale market. But um, so I'm do, I'm doing a little grafting project because we have a nursery. I'm doing some grafting for a grower in our area. We we're helping them pick out varieties, and you know some some of the greenhouse varieties that we were recommending is a dollar a seed. That can be hard to swallow, right? No, more than a dollar a seed. Think of it this way. You pick one more tomato off of that plant that, that is a dollar a seed, it's probably it's paid for the difference between, you know, a seed that's, I don't know, 10, 15 cents a seed. Uh, you know, so maybe maybe it's a full dollar more expensive. What are you selling tomatoes for? You get one more tomato off of that plant, it's paid for itself. And so disease resistance is where it's really gonna kick in because because as a grower, you get paid less, right? By the time you're you're selling your produce, you've already bought seeds, you've paid for your, you bought compost, fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, I think it's really important to understand that that um, your plants need to go the distance because if your plant if your plant makes it to September and then dies, well maybe that paid your seed bill and your fertilizer bill, but it probably hasn't paid you anything. But if your if your plant can stay healthy into October, that's where your your profit's going to end up being made, and so. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. In, in the grand scheme of things, most farms, the seed budget is not huge compared to labor, heat, you know, fertilizer, a lot of your other costs. And so, like I said, don't take it from me. Do a trial. You know, plant, you know, if you like, what, you know, whatever, you know, heirloom or whatever big big red beef steak you're growing that you like, well, pick pick. You know, they've got a lot of these varieties that are that are. A lot that are bred with heirloom stock, but they've got greenhouse um, greenhouse resistances bred in and stuff like that. You know, buy this, buy a packet, buy the smallest size you can. You know, if you're unconvinced, buy the smallest size that you can of the greenhouse variety. Plant, you know, a row or a few plants or whatever a meaningful size is to you. Look at them side by side because because that, you know, I won't say in every single case that that the additional cost um, pays for itself, but in a lot of cases it will. And you just need you know, that's the main thing. If you can keep those plants, particularly the plants that you pick over and over again, like tomatoes, you can, if you can keep those healthy, or if your lettuce doesn't slime down and it holds in your hoop house in the fall because it doesn't have downy mildew, you're going to make a lot more money than if the plant's dead or slimed. What can, thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, grafting. So um, yeah, I thought it's worth you know. So so um, grafting, I think, makes a big difference. In, you know, I've, uh, in fact, I think in the past I've probably not put enough emphasis on grafting. Uh, grafting, particularly in tomatoes, can make a huge difference. Um, I did a lot of a lot of trials and a lot of work with grafting when I when I was at Johnny's. I graft all our tomato plants now. Totally convinced me. 
Uh, in most of the trials where I was comparing ungrafted tomatoes to grafted tomatoes, we were getting somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 percent more tomatoes off the grafted plants. Now, you talk to the big commercial growers in hydroponic growing and stuff like that, they're, they're not going to tell you they're getting that big of a difference. Reason being, grafting is one of those strategies that makes more of a difference in adverse conditions than it does when everything's perfect. So, for example, if, every, if you've already got everything perfect, you know, the, the grafting, may, grafting may give you an additional 10%. On the other hand, those huge greenhouses, like, like the one in my backyard that is all tomatoes and 42 acres of them. So the, if they can get, the, they're all grafted plants. So I'd say the majority of the commercial greenhouses that I've gone to over the last decade, that they're not all grafted, but most of them are. Like I know that the, the 42 acre tomato greenhouse in my backyard, called Backyard Farms, they're all grafted. Um, because even though they, they, maybe they're only getting 10%, but they're getting an additional 10% on already a huge number. On the other hand, if you're, you know, most of us, like me, I'm growing in soil. Most, a lot of my, the production in the past has been um, unheated. And so basically I know m my plants may be having a little bit of fertility stress. They're definitely having some cold and heat stress, right? And so grafting is a, is, is a, a, uh, is a strategy that makes the plants stronger it basically gives them a stronger constitution and makes them more able to power through adverse conditions. So the reason that I have a picture of a tree up here where we're talking about vegetables for grafting is because I think some people think they are weirded out by grafting. Um, you know, it's, it's not like genetic modification. There's no, there's no interaction of the genes from the top plant to the bottom. And, you know, my point, this is just when I was on some trip out to California walking by an orchard, like, Oh, there's grafted plants, right? Because you can see that line right there down at the bottom where you have a, a, a bigger, a stouter. This is the root stock of this tree, and this is, a, the, this is the top variety. So it is, you know, the grafting, grafting that goes on in vegetables is the exact same principle that has been used on probably every single apple that you've ever eaten, every single grape you've ever eaten, every single glass of wine you've ever drank has been from, probably been from grafted trees. And so it's, in my, it's a natural process. It's taking, what it is, is it's taking advantage of the plant's natural ability to heal itself. You're just healing it to a different plant than it started out on. So I think for organic growers, it's a really good strategy because it doesn't involve any chemicals and it gives you, um, and it gives you a good, uh, it, it really improves your plant growth. So we could probably talk all day about grafting. I'm gonna keep it just, I think it's important to understand why, how it works, why grafting is, is important. So, um, I mean, the bottom line, like I have here, it can increase, increase the vigor, the disease resistance um, in tomatoes right now, and probably other rootstocks are coming down the pike. So, um, any one of those crops, so tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and an eggplant can all be grafted. I've done all of them. In fact, um, there are rootstocks that exist on the market for all of them. Right now in this country, tomatoes is the only crop that it's really important with. Uh, the reason being, so grafting, uh, herbaceous grafting, or say vegetable grafting, was developed in Asia. Um, and it's mostly used in Europe and Asia because Europe and Asia, they have a much larger land base, or they have a much larger population in relation to the land base that they have to grow things on. And because Asia and Europe are much older, they've been doing agriculture there for a lot longer. A lot of their soils that are suitable for growing these vining crops are already polluted with um, diseases. They've been growing crop, these vegetable crops for so long that they're already, um, that they have diseases. And so the idea is that they do it in Europe and Asia just to get a crop at all. Because what they do is they take whatever their, their favorite fruiting variety. So let's say, you know, you love Brandywine or German Johnson or something like that, but you have Fusarium and Verticillium and Corky Root in your, in your greenhouse soils, so you can't grow those varieties. The idea is you take your Brandywine or your German Johnson or whatever you like, you graft it onto a, um, onto a rootstock that is resistant to those diseases, and then, and then you can grow whatever variety that you want again. Once again, it's a great way for organic growers to get around disease problems that may exist without the chemicals. However, I haven't, my soilborne disease problems have not shown up in my hoop house. I still graft all of my plants because the, the vigor and, and the vigor turns into yield because it's a stronger plant. A stronger plant will yield more and it will power through 
those times when it's too hot or it has a little bit of disease or a little bit of pests or something like that. So um, even though I don't have disease problems in my hoop house yet, I mean, the, the reality of the situation is that you grow something in one place over and over again long enough. I'd be kidding myself if it's not going to show up one year. So even without the disease problems, we, you get more tomatoes. It's worth, it's worth the extra cost to either graft or it's a pretty tedious process. There's starting to be more people who are um, selling, who are selling, um, who may be able to, to, to sell you grafted plants. I'm not saying everybody. I used to think like, take the approach of like, oh, I just want to teach everybody how to graft. Everybody can do it. I realized, you know what? Not everybody's going to do it. I hope that more places will pop up in, I mean, you can, you can order grafted plants from Johnny's. I know there's other places out there that order grafted plants. So, uh, but it, I, I mean, it's kind of, you know, you got to get them through the mail. So my, my, my best case scenario would be that we have a lot regional nurseries pop up in our grafting plants for people in their community. So whether you, you, whether you figure out how to do it yourself or buy the plants from somebody else, there's definitely a, a production uh, boost there. And my other comment about the disease is that I don't think I have the soil-borne diseases that tend to be a problem in a greenhouse yet, but the way that you find out that you have the diseases is a bad one because it involves your plants dying. So, you know, I look at grafting, I'm sure it's paying for itself on the front end as increased production, and it's, I see it as cheap insurance on the back end because whenever those, whenever those diseases show up in my, um, in my greenhouse, the plants will probably not suffer for them. Is there a question? Yeah. Okay. So her question is that the, the rootstock is is resistant to um, soilborne soilborne diseases. Yes. I mean, the only qualification there is some of the rootstocks will say they have resistance to late blight and stuff like that. Shouldn't really be an issue because late blight is a foliar disease. So if you're just using it, I don't you know I don't really know. It would be interesting to talk to the breeder about that. It might be you know the the plants that they were breeding from that had late blight in the background and so that that resistance just happened to come through and so that's a bonus because late blight can you know you can get late blight lesions on the stem so that's that's a good thing but um i mean i'm, I'm glad you asked that question because uh we got to move on or else we're going to run out of time but there's one quick thing um so i just want to explain really quickly how rootstocks work is that um in they are they're hybrids just like a lot of the vegetable varieties that we 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 grow um and so what it is is it's it's really a trick to allow, it's, it's to allow plant breeders to focus just on the below ground parts of the plant, right? If you think about it, every single, every single vegetable variety, every, every, every plant that's been bred by a person is a compromise. You know, there's almost no perfect varieties. Because if you, if you looked at what breeders were taking into account for like breeding a greenhouse tomato, right? You wanna have fruit that tastes good. You wanna have fruit that looks nice. You wanna have um, it to be a vigorous plant. You want to be um, not susceptible to foliar diseases, not susceptible to root diseases. I mean, if, if you ask most breeders what they're breeding for in a, a greenhouse tomato, I mean, any crop, you probably, they could probably come up with 20 or 25 different things that are important. What, it's a trick. It, it, helps, it helps breeders get better root resistances because, because when they're breeding a rootstock, it's going to get chopped off. So they don't have to. The, the, the fruit on most rootstocks is gross. I know, I grew some out in the research greenhouse when we had leftover rootstocks. You know, it's not very high yielding. It doesn't, the fruit on rootstocks doesn't taste good anyway. It doesn't matter because they, they're bred to be decapitated and have another variety put on the top. So it's actually, it lets breeders, it lets breeders make progress on just those soil-borne diseases much faster because they can say, we're just going to focus on having a strong root system and soil-borne disease resistance. We don't have to worry about foliar disease resistance. Don't have to worry about what the fruit looks like. Don't have to worry about it, how it tastes, et cetera. Basically allows breeders to focus all their, all their efforts. And the other thing with, with the tomato rootstocks is what, what people are doing. You probably heard of hybrid vigor, where two, two, um, two species that are, basically the idea is that the, 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 the more dissimilar the two species are when they breed, the, the next generation, so that we call it the F1 or the first filial generation, um, is, is going to be more is going to be more vigorous than either of the parents. Okay, so um, the best example of this that I can think of is is a mule, right? A mule is the product. Uh, usually they have a Ginny mule and a male horse, 
have a baby because you'll get a bigger mule that way. And so many people think that the mules are stronger and smarter and, you know, in, in many ways tougher than either a horse or a donkey. So that's what they're doing with these rootstocks. What they're doing with rootstocks is they're breeding something like a garden variety tomato, solanum like persicum. They're breeding a garden variety tomato, tomato with some weedy wild tomato relative that, that uh, I'm imagining a breeder in a pith helmet out in South America tracking these things down. You know, these species that you probably never heard of, like Solanum hirsutum, Solanum pimpinellifolium, these different things. Because what, what breeders are doing is they're going back to the homeland of tomatoes. They're going to Mexico and Central America. And so they're finding these weedy wild varieties that uh, are tough because they're surviving out in the wild where nobody's taking care of them, right? And so they're surviving and they probably have all kinds of interesting disease resistances. And so they're, they're getting that same, it's called interspecific, it's called an interspecific hybrid when you breed two, when you breed, um, two, two um, organisms that are of a different species with each other. Whether it's a, you know, in the animal world and you're getting a, uh, a donkey and a horse to get a mule, or that, that's, that's how, I'm just saying, this is how they get an outrageous level of vigor into these rootstocks. Because if you've ever, um, if you've ever looked at the roots of, of a rootstock, I mean, it's just the, the root system is bigger. It will, it will, some, some growers have actually found they can fertilize their tomato crops less because the roots, the roots go out to find fertility. The roots explore more, and the plants are actually more thrifty because the root, the root system is bigger. For one thing, it's pulling nutrients from a bigger, uh, a bigger area, and it's more aggressive in going out there and getting them. So that's, you know, to, Grafting is both, it's a plant husbandry trick in one sense to get, you know, get the roots, get the two parts of the plant to heal together. It's also a breeding trick in that, you know, breeders are taking advantage of that interspecific level of hybrid vigor that's, that's greater than the intraspecific, you know, breeding just one tomato to another tomato. Um, you're getting this outrageous level of, of hybrid vigor. And it's allowing the, the breeders just to focus on the, the soil borne resistances. So grafting can make a big difference for all those reasons. Yes, yeah, that's a really good question, actually. A lot of, I know a lot of growers, um, particularly where they have, have diseases, like I've, I've heard of a lot of growers in the southeast and mid-Atlantic, they have a lot of fusarium and verticillium, a lot of, a lot of soil-borne diseases, they will, they will do it. Um, in fact, we, we, we used it, we st we've stopped growing cherry tomatoes for farmer's market, but, um, you know, one year, I, I was I was just working at Johnny, so I was kind of like grafting everything. And so I told my wife, I was like, hey, I'm going to graft our cherry and grape tomatoes this year. And she was like, you're just a grafting maniac. You know, she's like, aren't grape and cherry tomatoes vigorous enough on their own? No, this would be much better. Okay, so so that year I grafted all of them. And I, I, had a, I think I had a grafting disaster. Some of them died or something. But whatever it was, I ended up, I got to, we got to planting time. And we didn't have quite enough grafted cherry and grape tomatoes to fill. Our field space. So we filled in. We filled in with some ungrafted plants. What we noticed is that in September, when our nights started getting really cold, that the ungrafted plants just kind of quickly slowed down and stopped on their fruit production. The grafted plants kept pushing fruit pretty much until they got killed by frost. So this is my this is my point about the vigor is that having having that higher level of vigor just up, makes the plants stronger to overcome whatever, whatever difficulties you might throw at it, you know, the weather might throw at them, be it, be it temperature, be it pests, be it diseases. It basically just gives the plant a stronger constitution to overgrow whatever adversity it's running into. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's not a bad idea to, to do your field plants too. I mean, I think greenhouse where you're gonna get a higher return is a place to start. And then, then once you become a grafting fanatic, then just do them all. Or buy, or buy them from somebody else. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, there's about, there's the longest section of this book is actually on grafting because there's a few different ways to do it. And um, there's a few different ways to do it. And it's, it's tedious. It's, it's not rocket science, but it, you have to follow the, the thing. So yeah, the book, YouTube, in fact, actually, I'm planning, I'm going to do some videos and either put them on uh, Instagram TV or YouTube or both, because I have a, I have a grafting project coming up. And yeah, it's it's probably the kind of thing that's easier to to watch. So yeah, there's there's lots of there's vid, yeah lots of videos and things out there. Um, okay, so you asked the question about fertility. Um, I think it's really important 
to either use some kind of supplemental fertility in your greenhouse in the form of either fertigation or side dressing. The idea being, if you so so this is this is a shot so this is a shot right after we transplanted hoop house. You know these are grafted tomatoes in one of my hoop houses. So the idea is if you got a soil test, and so first of all, there's a special soil test called either the saturated media extract test or some places just call it the greenhouse soil test um, that is specifically for hoop house soils. And it was what we were talking about earlier is that you need a bigger, you know, if you think of your fertility as like a bucket, you need a bigger bucket full of fertilizer to grow, you know, a, a, a long season crop of tomatoes in, in, a, in a hoop house than, than field tomatoes. You know, they're just going to last longer. They need to be fed for longer. The problem being, if you got a soil, if you got that saturated media extract test, you got you got a soil test, and truly figured out all the fertility that those tomatoes would need for a whole season, and put it all on at the beginning, you could run into certain problems. The main thing, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the next slide, so we might as well just go there. Um, actually, I need to make this slide into like a few different slides because there's too much going on here, but. Um, Next time. So, but all the information's there. So the idea is that uh, two things are going on. For one thing, if you put the, one of the things that would happen is the plants would get too lush and vegetative. So if you put if you put all the nitrogen that those plants need for the whole season on right up front, they would go nuts. And and I mean, my my tomato plants tend to be too vegetative in the springtime anyway. That's partially just in the springtime, plants want to grow like crazy. They don't have a fruit load to kind of balance the plant out. They, they already tend to get too vegetative in the springtime. It gets even worse if you put if you put a whole a whole um, if you put a whole season's worth of, of nitrogen on on day one. They're gonna tend to get too they're gonna uh, they're gonna be too vegetative, which means they're gonna be super leafy, um, but they're going to also be prone to um, they're gonna be prone to pest and disease problems because. Plants that are too vegetative, they have that lush, like really bright green, soft look. Well, the reason they look soft is because they are. When plants are growing too lush, the cells are actually softer. It is easier for insects to come up and take a bite and attack them when the, the cell, they're lush and soft than when they're growing at a more or balanced rate. So, you know, as far as meeting the long-term fertility needs. So, first step is just get a soil test. I, w I couldn't, couldn't believe how many times... Uh, you know, one of my things I would do at Johnny's was help troubleshoot growers' problems. If they called into the call center, uh, you know, they might get to me and we just try to troubleshoot things. And I can't tell you how many times I talk to growers who are like, oh, this is growing on, going on with my tomato plant. I'm like, well, that kind of sounds like a nutrient imbalance. What was your soil testing? Growers? Like, I don't know. I haven't, don't have one. Like, okay, well, that's fine. But a, a, a lot of the answers to a lot of problems are going to, to be in a soil test. So the first step is just to get a soil test so you know, you know what you're dealing with. Um, so the other reason, the, the other reason why we don't want to put all the fertilizer on at the beginning of the season is that if the, uh, the other nutrients can create imbalances on their own. As you may be uh, aware, a lot of nutrients, it, 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 you know, it sounds weird. It's like, how can you have too much of a good thing? Well, if you have too much of a lot of nutrients, they will interfere with the uptake of other nutrients. Uh, so one good example is calcium. So calcium in excess of about 4,000 pounds per acre will interfere with the uptake of potassium, magnesium, and, uh, and manganese, okay? Um, phosphorus in excess, uh, excess of about 100 pounds per acre can interfere with the uptake of potassium, iron, and zinc. And um, this is especially important for growers who use a lot of compost because typically what we see, people who use a lot of compost, um, you can actually get over, you, you can get too much... Um, Actually, usually what we see first is there's is the too much phosphorus. Okay, so gr so growers who use either a lot of compost or compost exclusively, a lot of times the, the phosphorus level will actually get too high over time. And so um, that's that's you know what you just talked about how too much phosphorus could interfere with potassium, iron, and zinc. So our general recommendation is if you're using a lot of compost, is just apply compost. To, to meet your, your phosphorus needs, and if your, your nitrogen, potassium, and other micronutrients aren't met by that, that level of compost application, get other, more, other fertilizers to address the, the nitrogen and potassium and stuff like that. Uh, because if you, if, you keep, if you keep putting too much phosphorus on, you're going you're gonna to eventually get a, 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 an excess that is going to interfere with the uptake of other stuff. So, um, 
most of the vegetables that we grow want to grow in soil that's between five and a half and six and a half pH. Um, so um, if if you think about your hoop house, it's it never getting rained on or only getting rained on, you know, every third or fourth year when you take the plastic off or something like that. If if you're using irrigation water that's very basic or very acidic, that will actually over time change the change the the, the you know make your soil very very basic and very acidic. And so yeah, get, get test test your irrigation water because um, sometimes people are surprised. They don't know that they have water that's really acidic or really basic, and it's going to throw their soil their soil pH out of whack. Um, and the other thing is that um, sometimes if you live in an area that has hard water, that just means there's a lot of minerals in your water. And so that could be calcium. Calcium is actually really common for hard water, and there can be there can be other other things too. And so so that's why it's worth getting an getting an ear uh, a check on your irrigation water because there's things you can do. There are these if your water is extremely acidic or basic, you can get the, a little injector that ingests, injects, like if, you're, if your water is too basic, um, an injector can put citric acid. You know, so it's not a fancy chemical or anything. It's, it's, it's allowed under organics and everything. So you can, if you have serious problems with, if you're, with your irrigation water, there's, there are fairly simple solutions to, to deal with it. Um, so just mainly just, just find out. Um, find out what's in your irrigation water because a lot of times, a lot of times it's okay, you know, it's within spec, it's not a big deal, but if, if, it, your, if your irrigation water is really anything, uh, you want to, you know, you want to know before the, before the deficiencies and problems start showing up. So, um, pulse irrigation. In fact, I didn't know this, for, I was doing this for a while, I didn't realize it had a name, but people call it pul pul so pulse irrigation. And so, what we mean by pulse irrigation is, let's say you think that your crop uh, is, during, let's say during the summer, hot part of the year, you think your crop needs an hour's worth of water a day. Pulse irrigation is instead of putting, turning the faucet on for an hour, pulse irrigation means doing four 15-minute waterings or six 10-minute waterings. So, you know, you can, you can break it up. Um, basically, the idea is breaking up, instead of doing one big watering, breaking up your, your irrigation into, into, into multiple mini irrigations to make the total amount of watering you need. Uh, it may reduce root diseases in all crops because, because when you have standing water around the roots or really saturated water around the roots of a plant is when, was when you tend to get root diseases. That's why out in the field you'll tend to see root diseases start in the lowest part of the field where water collects and stands. So for one thing, you may have healthier roots um, in all crops if you, if you spread out that watering. Um, for tomatoes, it's particularly important because uh, it should reduce splitting, okay? Um, so one of the things that I think people like about heirlooms and think varieties like sun gold is that they have relatively thin skins. Uh, I think it's a mouthfeel thing, right? When you're eating the tomato, you hardly notice the skins, but, you know, really thin tomato skins are also not as strong. And so that's why heirlooms are kind of famous for splitting. Sun gold is notorious for splitting, right? So I was able to grow heirlooms, sun gold, and anything I really wanted in a greenhouse by just just, in, just spreading the waterings out instead of instead of putting it all on at once because if a tomato when a tomato plant gets a lot of water it tries to bank if it has too much water it tries to take that water up and bank it in the fruit which uh, the fruit when the fruit is green it's still fairly elastic but as the fruit starts ripening so turning red or whatever color its final color is going to be when when a tomato fruit is green it's elastic when its skin is changing color it is losing that elasticity, which is why your tomatoes always split right around when you were wanting to pick them, right? So the idea is if you don't have these big fluctuations in watering, you're just going to have less, less uh, splitting. Um, oh, blossom end rot also. So the, this is a special, once again, a special application for tomatoes is that um, blossom end rot, it's true, plus, like blossom end rot is a is a deficiency of calcium. It means there's not enough calcium is getting out to the, the very tip of the tomato. It's sort of like the furthest point on your tomato. It has to get, it, calcium has to go all the way out to the branch of the plant and then get all the way out to the tip. That's why um, blossom end rot is usually, is usually the worst in very long fruited tomatoes because it's just that little extra distance uh, for it to get. I don't know if you guys have noticed if you're growing San Marzano or other really elongated tomatoes, Blossom end rot tends to be the worst in the, the, the long-fruited tomato uh, 
uh, tomato types. Now, even though technically blossom end rot is a, is, is, means that there's not enough calcium getting out to the blossom point on that tomato, um, you can have blossom end rot even though there's plenty of calcium in the soil. Um, blossom end rot can also happen if um, it's either there's in a really big drought kind of situation or when there's too much water because um, anything that kills off the root hairs on the roots, calcium is kind of hard to take up and kind of and it's not very mobile within the plant. So anything that disrupts the uptake of calcium, which can be the, the roots sitting in water for a few days can do it. Or conversely, if in the really dry conditions, the roots may not be able to take up enough calcium. Um, that, that, can, that can lead to blossom end rot, even though there's enough calcium there in the soil. So that's why uh, just keeping a nice, even amount of moisture in the soil may, may help, uh, help uh, prevent blossom end rot. Mm hmm Well, yeah, I think if, especially if you have well-drained soil, you can probably get away. Once again, it's a framework, you know, it's pick and choose, the smorgasbord, you know, take what you like and leave what you don't with this whole talk. So, so, but yeah, yeah, I mean, somebody who has clay soils or, you know, particularly poorly drained soils is going to benefit more than, say, you know, if you have really well-drained soil. So maybe, maybe it's not as, you know, if you're not having problems with blossom end rot, not having problems with, with um, splitting, maybe, maybe you don't need to do it. Just, it's just an idea. Oh, good question. So she asked what, what technology I'm using to do that. And so there's a really simple um, irrigation timer that I've used. It's by a company called DIG. And so I don't know if it's DIG or DIG, but um, I think they, I mean, it's, it's available a lot of places. If you, if you, uh, if you search a DIG irrigation controller, you'll find it. And so that's 30 or 40 bucks. And that's not the, there's a couple of companies that make similar ones. It's just this little thing that goes on, that screws on your, um, on your hose. And so you can program that for up to four irrigations per day. So that's a cheap one. If there, there's, if you, there's a lot of irrigation technology out there. That's what I'm saying. I just use the simplest thing. Because a lot of these years I was still, I was working off the farm full time at Johnny's. And so, you know, I want to be able to set it and forget my irrigation timer and not wonder, like, oh, did somebody remember to water the tomatoes? And so uh, I just got a simple $30 or $40 one that had four, four um, programming. Like, you could form, program up to four irrigation cycles. And so I would just, I mean, I was very, there, there are things like tensionometers. There's very, various different types of irrigation sensors you can put in the soil. I didn't do any of that. I just, I just knew that as the plants got bigger, and the weather got hotter, they'd need more water. And so I'd start out at the beginning of the season with, you know, three, five minute waterings or something like that. And then I would just, I would just look at the soil, look at the plant growth and just add, add more time ever, you know, until we got to the peak of the season. Um, and depending on how hot it is, you know, just more, more water. If we were going to have a really hot week, I'd add a few minutes to each irrigation. Um, but, you know, vice versa, if, you know, if, if I knew it was going to be rainy and overcast all day long, I would just turn it off, right? Because if the idea is uh, you definitely want to be pay, paying attention to the weather. You don't want to be putting more water at the base of your plants if, if, they're, if it's not sunny and they're not taking it up. So it's really simple. You know, you can get a really simple irrigation timer like that, and then there's much, much more complicated stuff if you, if you want something fancier. So this white ground cover is one thing that a lot of these um, big greenhouses use. So this, this is a picture of my, uh, one of my greenhouses right after we planted it up. And so uh, why, why light colored ground cover is a, is a good thing is because uh, it's twofold. So for one thing, all the light that hits the floor, um, if it gets bounced back up into the canopy, you can, um, the plants can use it even though it's hitting them on the underside. And so I forget, there's some number, but most, most of the light that hits the floor of the greenhouse, if you re reflect it back up into the plants, they can, they can still make use of it. 
And the other application is just keeping the greenhouse cool. So you're all familiar with that in the, the field they put down black plastic. Well, I, you know, most of the greenhouses, like here's a picture, this is a picture of a big greenhouse. I've never been to one like this. They just built this greenhouse. So this is gonna be a uh, cucumber greenhouse. You can see um, it was brand new, never had a crop in it. You can see how, how light it is in there uh, because the whole place is covered in white. And so the idea is that um, almost as, you know, by springtime, you go from trying to struggling to keep your greenhouse warm enough to struggling to keep your greenhouse cool enough. And so if you put down the other thing that light, light colored fabric or light colored um, cover does is it just keeps the greenhouse from overheating. And it doesn't have to be plastic. Um, you know, you could use light colored straw or there's planters paper. I mean, I'm not saying you have to use plastic. There's a lot of different materials out there that will, you know, achieve maybe Maybe white paper wouldn't be quite as reflective as a plastic, but maybe you feel good not using the plastic, you know, and st it would still have that cooling effect of not of not absorbing all that heat and contributing to your, your greenhouse being too hot. So like, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we. Uh, so his question is, when do we put the light, the light colored ground cover on? Um, honestly, we, we we would put it on pretty pretty close to the beginning of the season. I mean, in my area, for an unheated hoop house, we would end up planting the tomatoes like the third week of May. And so, usually, we it's like that picture that you saw earlier. Yeah, like this. So usually, usually we plant the plants and then scramble around and do something else. For the but we would throw the white white ground cover on as soon. You know, as soon as um, as soon as we could get around to, to doing, it. just because you know, almost by that by that point in late May, early June, um, sunny day, sunny day, the greenhouse is already starting to overheat, and so it's not a you know, it doesn't. Yeah, I guess we don't we don't care. We don't we don't get bothered if we don't don't get the light ground cover down the day that tomatoes are planted, but we do it pretty much as soon as we can get around to it. Once again, maybe you know, may, you might be right. Maybe you know, maybe you, maybe you think uh, you want to let leave the ground cover up for a few days. I mean, that's true. The the soil, you know, just having that darker colored soil there might actually warm the soil up faster, and you can put it down. So that's that's how we do it. But you may, there might be a better way that works for your farm. Yeah. So I do it. I strip off the all these Yeah. Right. Yeah, good good question. So we strip we do strip the leaves too. We just hadn't gotten around. You know, it's one of those things like ideally that you know, we'd have some we ideally we'd strip the leaves at planting. But yeah, we if if using ungrafted plants, so his question was about how we have our, our plants planted pretty shallowly for for tomato plants, because as you probably know, you know, you can dig a really deep hole for tomato plants and they'll form roots all along the stem wherever they're buried. We d didn't want this to happen because they are grafted plants. The, the graft union is down here, maybe an inch. In fact, I, we even, these, these and the tomatoes got, they just weren't very tall. And the graft union is really close to the soil. So you can see how, I mean, I would not normally transplant um, plants with, with a pot kind of sticking out of the ground. I put this slide up here to show you what not to do. So I wouldn't normally do this, but the, these ones ended up just getting grafted really close to the soil line. And what I, so this is, okay, this is a good point. I'm glad you asked the question because it's a good point about grafted plants. You can't bury grafted plants the way that you do the regular plants because if, if this top stem roots, you know, if you planted it this deep and it, the, the rootstock is only down here, and you would have a, several inches of stem in the ground. The, when the stem roots out into the ground, if you have verticillium, fusarium, any of those soil-borne diseases, it's going to come in through the, where the, the top variety is rooted in, and this, this rootstock isn't going to act as a blocker anymore. That's, that's, why, that's why we did that. All right, we're almost done. We're also almost out of time, so I'm going to try to – actually, yeah, we're pretty close to being done here, so – um, just like Steve was talking about, this is uh, the, the ProtectNet. So this, I, I think this actually is ProtectNet from Dubois Agrinovation. Um, so 
Um, we had a really bad problem with cucumber beetles on our cucumbers. So the thing is, cucumber beetles lay their eggs in the soil, they pupate out early in the season. And I think what happens is that, um, you know, the cucumber beetles emerge in the springtime, a little before most people have their cucurbit crops out in the field, at least in our area. So the, the cucumber beetles come out and our cucumber transplants are what's on the menu. So we had a terrible time, both with them just chewing the heck out of our plants, but also transmitting bacterial wilt. And so to the point where we were start, we were thinking, if we can't get a handle on this problem, we can't really grow cucumbers anymore because we're certified organic. You know, but we have some sprays, but they're, you know, the best, you know, the best thing for us is just have a good defense. Our best offense is a good defense. And so what we did is we threw these, you know, so we did our hoop houses have double, double wiggle wire track up here at the hip. So what we did is we put the, uh, we put this insect netting in the bottom track of wiggle wire. And then we have wiggle wire there, and so just use wiggle wire to, to attach it in. Um, you know, this is something I, 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 a lot of people do is they put, you know, put one one section of plastic on the greenhouse so that the cold air doesn't blow right in the corners. So we had that's why we have wiggle track wiggle wire track here to hold this piece of plastic. So what we did is we just pulled the wiggle wire out, put the layer of um, protect net on top of that, and wiggle wired it back in. And then this is just, this is Joel's old blue. Uh, irrigation header line lay flat and so when we had old, odd sizes and pieces that had holes in it you know we just hung on to it split it open and just put staples through it because if you know if you put a staple straight into to netting it's likely going to tear out and so the idea was that the um, the staples hold it to the, the baseboard without ripping through um, so this this is uh, this is a greenhouse uh, University of Arizona and same thing. They, they, so the, the reason I have this picture is because protect, any kind of netting will really slow down your airflow. And so the, the recommendation is if you're using really fine netting, like I think out in Arizona, they're using this for white flies or thrips, so very small predator. That's one important thing about the netting. You need to get netting that's smaller than your, your, your pest species, of course, right? So if you're buying it from somebody like Dubois, you can call them up and say, I'm trying to exclude you know, cucumber beetles or thrips or whatever you're trying to exclude, they can tell you what size netting you need for that. But for the really small netting, like you can see this, it almost looks like cheesecloth or something. You know, the, the really small netting, you need to quintuple your surface area to get back to your original airflow. That's why I put this picture up here because see they have, you know, this is essentially, they framed out this little box. So they've got, you know, to get back to the original airflow from this fan, they've got four sides and then a face. And so they more or less did that. They, you know, they have, they, they quintupled the surface area of protect net that they put on to, to, to get back to the original airflow through that fan. All right, so, oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, good question. Um, we never get them all. I mean, they're, you know, if cucumber beetles aren't, really small but they're small enough somehow somehow they get in what it has been is that um the the having the netting on because uh okay yeah we didn't net the doors we didn't there you know we didn't do every single every single opening because some of them just get in and so what it does is having that netting on there keeps them down to a dull roar you know so we can um so we can we can we can kind of deal with them, or you know, if they get relatively bad, we can control them with uh, spinosad. Like we've had luck with spinosad. But the thing is, when there's tons of them, you can you know, at least for us, we can, we can we can sprays wouldn't do enough when there's tons of them. But when we're excluding most of them and there's just a few, we can we can deal with them. Yeah. 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 And I'd like to try them in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, it's not going to sue it, but that gets you, gets you like a set of nets. Yeah. That, well, that, that's what, that was our result. That we never got rid of them all, but we kept them manageable. And so, yeah, we could pick, we could, we could pick the same planting of cukes for two or three months. Sure. All right, so this is my last slide before questions. We're pretty much out of time anyway, but 
Um, so, I mean, one last thing. What you know, I have this picture of this heater up there. Uh, whether whether you have heat or not, it's the idea is is you know 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 what know you got to know what what temperature kind of temperatures your crop wants to deal with, and if you if you have heat and you want to spend the money, then you know that'll let you know what to keep it at. If you don't have heat, you just have to you know it tells you when to when to plant. And so I mean an example from my own growing. Um, when I was younger, I was just I just wanted to jump the gun. You know, I wanted to plant plant, plant get plants out in the hoop house as early as possible because I was like, we're doing this to be early, right? So we have to be as early as possible. And so as soon as the 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 temperature would get out of the 30s, we plant, and then of course they would revise the the forecast, and we'd be up all night biting our nails, wondering if we should put a heater out in the hoop house and that kind of stuff. And you know, what I've realized is tomato plants don't want to be out planted out when it's anywhere near the 30s or 40s, right? There, so uh, whether you have heat or whether you just you just need to work around it. Uh, it. I mean, an example there is what we do now is we just put we just put our tomato plants in bigger pots and just hold them because they can be growing the same amount of time. Um, the idea is that your tomato plant is going to be a lot happier when it's in a uh, in, in your propagation house. It's going to be much happier in a in a pot in your propagation house than getting it. Than putting it out in your um, in your hoop house if it's anywhere near the 30s and 40s. So um, temperature management can be any, anywhere from active actively managing the temperature in the case of a greenhouse, or simply just knowing what the temperature requirements of the crop are. You know, if you're not sure, just look look it up, find out what you know what temperature the uh, the, the your crop wants to be at, and um, and, and work around that. So my last slide, my Go Dutch, be efficient, grow high value crops that make the most of your space. And uh, we got, you know, we're, we're, we're almost at time, but I'm happy to, you know, if you guys want to ask questions, I'm happy to stay for, you know, I'm not going anywhere, so we can keep it. Um, and we'll also make sure what we hope is a great uh, Awesome. Thanks, thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> That's a good question. It has more. With, it has more to do with what's going on in my farm. And yeah. I, so it's we. A couple of years ago, we took over. So we just changed our farm. We stopped doing produce for the farmers market because we got the opportunity to take over someone's nursery business, and so that's what we're using the greenhouse space for. And I'm trying to. I want to get more into wholesaling, so I'm trying to bigger build a bigger greenhouse. So yeah, the cherry tomatoes is not production. It's just my own. What's going on? I know that people have sent cheating systems. Toby was talking about it for growing the seedlings. Mm -hmm. Do even small growers use tubing of water in their soil so that they don't have to then in the air space as much? Because, of course, you're saying tomatoes don't like to be out at 40 degrees, right? But if you're heating your soil through hot water, Tubing, then you could keep the soil temp far closer to say 60, right. right, or 70, where you're keeping your air temp only at uh -huh. 45 degrees. Yeah, so you're talking about heating the actual growing beds, right? Heating the actual soil, yeah. Yeah, some people do that. I mean, there's there are commercial systems. There are commercial systems. And then, uh, a year or two ago, in growing for market, we got there was a grow greenhouse grower in Colorado who talked about how they they just made their own. Their own soil heating system. Took a hot water heater, put it out in a greenhouse, and then they just, you know, put 
the tubing down in the soil and it circulates. In that case, they're circulating water. But um, so yeah, I mean that can be yeah. Soil temperature is really important. And so now it does seem to have caught on. Like from 2000, you know, 10 years ago when high tunnels were starting out at SCS, you know, even before they were offered, I mean everybody jumped on the bag, but it made it absolutely made sense and it was it was a no no brainer. Right. If you had the money to put up, who does you do it? But for heating, people don't seem to. There does it just because the systems are too expensive or too complicated. Or you said the guy in Colorado. I don't remember the article, but I'm sure I have it. But I mean, I've heard time, oh, they're not cheap. People are good. Okay. Factor. Yeah. 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 Y
the other one there. That's how you get those sort of orange and yellow chunks. You mean when when there's a you've cut a lot of the leaves off and they're getting hit directly with the sun? Yeah. 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 Well, have you tried different varieties? Because I know some of that different varieties are more susceptible or less. Yeah. And the cherries don't. Will con contribute to that. So if you if you're on top of your potassium, that should help. Um, it is you know varietal, I and mean, you'll see like sometimes we see where we had lots of varieties planted out. Some varieties would have green shoulders really bad, and some wouldn't have it at all. So 